sustainability and innovation beyond traditional corporate governance. It is being organized by EY, ECODA, and the Slovenian Directors Association in international partnership with ACCA, Business Europe, and European issuers. Conference brings together decision makers, directors, academia, key, key business experts from EU and beyond. We have over 600 applications for this conference from around 50 countries. So um, a discussion about corporate governance along the lines of sustainability and innovation is quite timely, given uh, the European Commission ongoing initiatives related to the European Green Deal and the Capital Markets Union, such as sustainable corporate governance, corporate sustainable reporting and external audit. So questions um, we will try to find answers to at today's conference are how to ensure the companies do not just green their activities, but embed new strategic models, how corporate governance and reporting obligations can increase understanding of the changing scene and new challenges to better foster the long term existence of companies. So today we are discussing if we are witnessing a real paradigm shift or not. Let's get started. I'm happy to give a floor to our first speaker today for the opening speech, Julie Tigland. She is the EMEA Area Managing Partner and EY Global Leader Women Fast Forward. Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irena. And behalf on EY, a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today. It's an honor and a privilege to open today's conference. I really believe that we're at a pivotal point in human history with the tremendous opportunity to push the reset button on the EU economy and corporate governance has a pivotal role to play. I know it may sound like an exaggeration. I mean, a pivotal point in human history, but I really believe that we're in the middle of a paradigm shift, a shift that's been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And today, as we meet, world leaders remain gathered in Glasgow to address yet another existential crisis, the impact of climate change on our planet. Amidst all of these challenges, there's been a shift in thinking. Successful CEOs and business leaders realize now more than ever that business have a greater responsibility to play in tackling global challenges. While national borders and cultures obviously still exist, these disruptors don't just observe boundaries. Our entire ecosystem, whether that's our natural ecosystem or our economic ecosystem, is filled with interdependencies. Creating a better future requires all of us to be at the table and to understand the wider societal role we all must play. At EY, our purpose is to build a better working world. That's why we do what we do. And at the heart of that purpose lies the origin of our profession, to build trust in capital markets. Trust, the very fundamental currency of business. It's long been a key asset for any relationship, for any transaction, whether that's for business or individuals. In this new environment, Retaining trust requires all of us to go further than ever before. It's no longer just enough to really work to the delivery of a bottom line figure. It needs to be more. It needs to work to succeed in terms of non-financial dimensions, to include social, environmental aspects of performance. All of this is required because growth in the future must be sustainable. It must deliver value that benefits all stakeholders, employees, shareholders, and the wider society. It's in this context in which CEOs and other leaders need to take a pause, to step back and reevaluate the point beyond mere profits, the real purpose of business. And a purpose must contribute a positive impact in the wider world. This is an imperative that comes from ensuring that our world is sustainable and it's going to require actions, 
that are measurable. Against this backdrop, EY conducted our first long-term value and sustainable corporate governance survey last year. The new expectations of shareholders and stakeholders were very clear. 66% of business leaders told us that stakeholders expect companies to drive societal impact, environmental sustainability, and inclusive growth. Did you know that more than three quarters of them say that a focus on sustainable and inclusive growth is absolutely critical to building trust with stakeholders in uncertain times? Effectively, we see organizations moving away from shareholder primacy towards stakeholder capitalism. Stakeholder capitalism recognizes that the interests of shareholders are best served when organizations consider the long-term interests of all of their stakeholders. Sustainable corporate governance is key to ensuring that a company has both a long-term vision and is able to balance short-term priorities with long-term investments. The report highlighted four key success factors for boards and CEOs looking to drive long-term value and to meet the long-term interests of their stakeholders. And I'd like to walk you through those four. The first and probably least unexpected is board dynamics and composition. The board really ensures that a company stays on a visionary path despite potential changes in its CEO. To be successful at managing risk and seizing new opportunities over the long term, a board needs to be composed of a diverse range of people, not just in terms of gender, but backgrounds. In research, having enough trust to be honest, to debate openly, and have healthy disagreement, these factors emerged as the most important attributes of a board that generates long-term value. You won't be surprised when I tell you that remuneration was the second critical factor. Our research highlighted that one of the major internal challenges to long-term value orientation within an organization is the necessary alignment to long-term performance and reward, and not only for the CEO, but for all executives. The third factor is engagement. Boards need to be transparent with investors and other stakeholders about their long-term value strategy and their governance practices. By proactively engaging, boards will have a better understanding of what investor wants. They'll be able to secure workforce buy-in and use their long-term strategy as a foundation to build trust with their customers and with wider consumers. And last, but certainly not least, is measurement. A long-term focus requires boards to view corporate performance as more than just financial profit. They need to understand the organization's performance in areas providing value to customers, to employees, and to society at large. They should use the long-term non-financial value metrics to set strategic targets, to steer the business, evaluate progress, and communicate performance. One set of metrics that clearly could be used for this purpose is the WEF's stakeholder capitalism metrics. These are being adopted by many international business leaders, and I'm very proud to say that EY not only helped develop them, but we're adopting them, we're taking our own measure or our own medicine, and we're using them to measure our own progress. Sustainable corporate governance is a key enabler to embed a long-term focus, and one that's within our control to change. We hope to share with you some new insights, including a view on the role that boards play in addressing ESG factors when our new report is published early next year. We all know that a strong corporate governance framework should deliver high quality corporate reporting. As stated by Commissioner McGinnis this May, if we wanna build up the capital markets union, we need high quality, reliable, and easily accessible corporate reporting. When considering policy changes to increase the quality of corporate reporting, we need to look at each of the three pillars, corporate governance, auditors, and supervisors. We need to look at it systematically and based on a robust understanding of the issues. Each pillar in itself needs to be strong and work well together. 
Ultimately, any changes should help rather than hinder the delivery of a capital markets union, including a greater consistency of requirements across the EU. Reporting is going to be key, key to ensuring that organizations set sustainability goals and measure their progress towards meeting them by equipping boards and management teams with invaluable insights to shape business strategy, as well as providing them transparency around sustainability, transparency that's given to the external stakeholders, including, but not only investors. The issues that we have today at stake are global and the investors are global. Having a globally consistent and comparable baseline for sustainability reporting as part of a building block approach on which key jurisdictions can build will help the US the EU-based companies that operate at scale globally to more easily accommodate any incremental reporting at the local level. Globally recognized frameworks and standards for sustainability reporting, or at least frameworks and standards that are globally consistent, make perfect sense. We applaud the EU for its global leadership on this front. International convergence is also important and in the field of assurance standards for trusted sustainability reporting. To meet the envisioned CSRD timeframe, we suggest that ECM member states adopt a very pragmatic approach. We suggest that they build on international assurance standards instead of recreating the wheel. The proposed clarification in the CSRD of individual and collective responsibility of management and supervisory board for reporting is a welcome addition, as well as the duty of the audit committees to oversee this reporting. These additional duties will require broader expertise and skills as the scope of reporting widens. It's going to change the shape of our boards and management in the future. High quality financial and sustainability reporting is going to be dependent on strong risk management and internal controls in their preparation. If directors are going to meet their duties and make statements with confidence, they need to know that their reporting is robust and reliable to help guard against misstatements and greenwashing. Here, there is an opportunity for European policymakers to drive higher standards and greater consistency in this area, to ask companies to be transparent about the conditions of those systems. And I'd make a small analogy. You know, we don't ask motorists to drive cars with speedometers and dashboards that are never checked by mechanics. Why do we expect directors to do the same for their companies? Better information and internal controls and risk management systems, they will all work together to improve the overall resilience of businesses and the effectiveness of reporting. Consistency and transparency in the supervision of corporate reporting and audits is critical for trust in the overall corporate reporting ecosystem. More cohesion and coordination of supervisory activities, including sanctioning and public reporting of measures would be an important milestone towards building the capital markets union. I'm not just making these comments without making sure that EY is also doing their part. I said earlier that building a better future requires all of us to be at the table. That includes us. At EY, we're committed to providing the technical skills and resources to help advance the EU initiatives, including aiding the alignment and the convergence of EU and global initiatives to set the standards in reporting, lowering the risk for investors through prevention and early detection of issues is possible. EY believes that the corporate governance and reporting ecosystem can be improved, particularly by strengthening risk management and internal control systems. For our part, we'll be investing in building sufficient in-house competencies across multiple disciplines in the ESG domain to meet public expectations for enhanced audit procedures and integrated solutions, as well as to be able to provide high quality assurance on sustainability information under the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. We're also going to significantly increase our investment in talent and technology in the coming years, allowing them to work seamlessly 
together to help improve. However, I do know that auditors, we cannot succeed on our own. Corporate governance and reporting ecosystem, including management, boards, audit committees, standard setters, and regulators, we all need to work positively and constructively with auditors on financial and sustainability reporting, as well as matters like fraud and going concern, if we're going to make a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges we face have the potential to deliver positives beyond just an understanding of the collective responsibility we bear. It's been amazing to see the unprecedented innovation emerging from businesses and the ingenuity, the cooperation, and the flexibility of humankind in response to this pandemic and effectively also the climate emergency. We all know that change is possible, but for change to take place, there must be a dialogue and collaboration. Long-term value creation will only become a reality if organizations work together with policymakers to really benefit all. The European institutions, national governments, and businesses now have a great opportunity to push the reset button for the EU economy, to plan together for risk-aware, transformative, innovative, and sustainable growth scenarios. Business leaders must use these uncertain times to lead with increased purpose and with long-term value at the center of their business strategy. Building a better working world, it really means leaving this planet in a better place for the next generation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is everybody's business. Thank you very much for allowing me to open this wonderful session. Irena, back over to you. Thank you, thank you, Julie. Many thanks for your inspiring opening speech. Now I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Sala Sathamoinen, Acting Director General, DG Just European Commission. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, uh, let me thank you all your organizers for inviting me to speak about the Commission's plans. Uh, what we are uh, planning, what we are intending to do in the field of the company law and uh, corporate uh, governance. Uh, so, uh, uh, dear participants, uh, dear uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, uh, it was really a pleasure uh, listening to uh, Julia Teichland's opening speech. We will be uh, very much uh, singing the same song, if not singing, but at least speaking uh, to the same uh, tune. Uh, we have also found in the European Commission that the need for action comes very much from the stakeholders' expectations. Today, consumers, employees and investors are requiring a higher standard from companies. They ex expect sustainable value creation and reliable disclosures uh, reflecting their sustainability considerations. We consider uh, that the commitment to sustainable value creation can and indeed should still improve, even at the expense of maximum short-term financial return. The problem of the lacking uh, uh, or the, uh, still the shortcomings in this area is actually expected to grow over the time. And this despite of the uh, situation that awareness of the issue uh, is improving and should improve, the challenge is that the change is not probably sufficiently quick, sufficiently even, and systemic and widespread. The COVID-19 pandemic, uh, with its devastating economic and social consequences, has further highlighted the need for urgent change in many companies' behavior. Quest for a resilient supply chain has shown the importance of embedding social fairness and environmental protection in corporate governance. Today's conference is an opportunity to reflect on the way companies operate and are managed. If one of the conclusions is that the legal framework uh, still fails to sufficiently foster the sustainability in business operations, then the legal framework needs changing too. Corporate governance, 
encompassing the decision making structures, management processes, and the allocation of the competencies within the company is important for providing proper accountability and incentives. Uh, contemplating a horizontal EU level action in this area has been a new idea and has recognized the cross uh, sectorial nature of the challenge. The evidence uh, gathered uh, that it has shown uh, some, however, slow progress of the companies towards sustainability, and it has clearly pointed out uh, towards support across the board for immediate EU action. At the political level, two European Parliament reports specifically called on the Commission to strengthen the dimension of sustainability in directors' duties and to propose EU rules on the comprehensive corporate due diligence obligations. We need to act in order to rebuild the trust in the economy that works for all. This is an economy where human and environmental boundaries of value creation are respected. It is an economy where all stakeholders' interests are taken into account and their ideas harvested for the innovation. A, de uh, a decade ago, we commenced with the United Nations guiding principles on the business and human rights. So we do have the, the international uh, framework to start with and to build on. Now, uh, the reflections and actions are about to culminate in, an, in this uh, legislative proposals from the Commission that we are planning to issue. The initiative on the sustainable corporate governance uh, will be an important contribution on uh, mainstreaming uh, the protection of human rights and the environment in the company's behavior. The initiative, as you well know, we are still preparing. Uh, it aims at contribution to the transition towards a sustainable economy and uh, to foster sustainable value creation and improve long-term performance and resilience of the EU companies. Uh, we have carried out an impact assessment that is looking into different elements. One important building block are possible EU-wide rules on corporate due diligence to identify, prevent and mitigate adverse impacts on the company's own operations and its value change. We are also looking into how, uh, how future due diligence duty could be best aligned with internationally recognized human rights and labor standards and uh, or international um, environmental commitments and EU goals. Another question being considered is about clarifying that directors have a duty to act in the best interest of the company by pursuing long-term value creation and managing sustainability risks. Also through the due diligence that I was mentioning. Uh, we are furthermore exploring best ways of effective enforcement, including civil liability and enforcing compliance by administrative authorities. We are taking into account the huge number of the stakeholder contributions that we have received in the process. That includes the almost half a million responses to the open public consultation received earlier this year, but also the continuous stakeholder feedback throughout the process. Our work is carefully weighting the possible costs and the benefits of policy options in order to design an impactful and meaningful tool which will bring a real change on the ground. Needless to say that we will pay particular attention to the proportionate solutions and to avoiding unnecessarily burdening companies. This means also the coherence with all existing EU uh, key and frameworks. And I should stress that uh, we know the importance of finding solutions that work within the spectrum of existing corporate governance systems of the member states. The Commission is also paying uh, particular attention uh, to ensuring consistency. Uh, I mentioned a key, whether it's thematic or sectoral initiatives. Let us not underestimate the challenge, but let us not forget the benefit. The sustainable corporate governance can help improve the financial performance based on the different factors such as better risk management, improve over operational efficiency and cost savings, better resilience, more innovation 
and so on and so forth. Due to the global outreach via value chains, uh, third country companies and economies would experience positive impacts on the human rights, including labor rights and on the env uh, environment. This instrument uh, uh, will be paramount in helping us rebuilding an economy that works for all today and tomorrow and in the future. Uh, I will not give you more details today. I just invite you to, to show a little more patience. This will be in the college agenda then to make the final uh, decisions. Uh, when we look indeed the future, what we, what we would like to see, let's, let me think about and give you one vision. Uh, we see companies quickly adapting to change, investing in development, innovation, human and natural capital, fostering long-term productivity, competitiveness and resilience, and optimizing return for members and shareholders. Sustainable companies are among the most innovative ones today, and long-term sustainability focus is positively correlated with innovation. Eventually, such business models will drive the economy, innovative capacity, productivity, growth potential, and resilience, including its long-term competitiveness. If we move fast, we will be front runners in the Europe. And the front runner businesses are already profiting from switching to sustainable business models and sustainable corporate governance. If we move fast, we will contribute to building the competitive and sustainable economy based on the regenerative growth model conscious, uh, model conscious that we only have one planet. If we move fast, we will strengthen our voice and positive impact also in the global scene. With these, I wish you a very fruitful discussions and I'm looking forward to the conclusions of this uh, conference. Thank you. Huge thank you to Acting Director General of the DG Just for taking time to add a high level policymaker stone to our conference. Thank you. Next on our program is a fireside chat between Dr. Roger Barker, Director of Policy and Corporate Governance at the Institute of Directors UK, and Goran Espelund, board member at Lenebo Fonder. Fireside chat will be moderated by Andrew Hobbs from EY, EMEI Public Policy Leader. Please, Andrew, take the floor. Thanks, Serena, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome from my side to, to this uh, uh, corporate governance conference for this year. Really excited to, to see what discussions are about to follow. And um, let me add my welcomes as well to, to Roger and Goran, um, who are going to join me on this fireside chat. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of get you all in the mood and started because we've had some great uh, provocations and, and food for thought from Julie and Salah um, uh, just now. I'm going to just turn to, to both Roger and Goran to just get a few perspectives um, on uh, the remarks they've heard. I mean, just just to get you get you started. I mean, Julie um, talked about really the importance um, that corporates are by themselves attaching to the whole issue of sustainability and talked about sort of some particular areas where um, action was um, possible, particularly around looking at board composition, um, the, the, the need to align remuneration incentives, um, the benefits of engaging with, with, with stakeholders, uh, not just investors, to, to kind of get that feedback loop going. And, and of course, as you'd expect, firms like ours to say the importance of measurement of performance. And then Salah again talked about, you know, the, the, the strong call for action that, that the, the European Commission has heard to develop policy in this area. Um, and um, I think that the thing that really struck me as well was the point that she made about the interaction between sustainability and innovation. In other words, she pointed to, to sort of companies that are focused on sustainability can often be the most innovative. So those were the, the sort of the the, the the takeaways for me. But just just passing on to you, you guys, I mean, what do you take away from it so far? Um, if I may start. Uh, Please, Goran, yeah. The, the one that caught me was... Uh, you know, sustainable companies are more innovative and maybe also more profitable. Um, then I started thinking, okay, and, and what is that sustainable company? Because I think we would disagree on how we're going to define, you know, sustainability. And that comes back to Julie, where I think the most important thing is we talk about high quality financial reporting, uh, but we do need high quality 
sustainability reporting too as investors to judge or consumers for that matter. And I know there's a lot of initiatives ongoing. Uh, taxonomy is one. The problem we as investors have today is that there's so many initiatives and there's so many different reporting standards out there. So it's, it's hard to really you know, call what is that sustainable company. Yes, I, um, I think that, you know, Judy made a very important overall point, which is that we really have in the last few years shifted towards a system of stakeholder capitalism. I think that's a very important thing to recognize. There has been a transition from shareholder primacy to stakeholder capitalism um, and also tying in with this idea of business having a, a purpose, a broader purpose, which goes above and beyond simply making a financial return, but actually links to some social impact is, is incredibly important. And I think you know now that the challenge for all of us, both for boards and policymakers, is, is to bring our systems up to date and align them with that shift to a new system of stakeholder capitalism. And there, and there are many implications of that across regulation, law, board composition, reporting, um, and, and many other things. But, you know, that, that's really, for me, that's going to be one of the key corporate governance tasks of the next decade. Well, there I'm, I'm uh, you know, maybe I'm, uh, uh, I don't know, growing up in a socialist country, uh, more or less. Uh, I'm a little surprised about that because, um, you know, the way I've seen Swedish corporate over the years, uh, they, they, you know, we have, we have a corporate law and there's a profit motive for the, the company. But that they would not, uh, you know, see that they have to look to other stakeholders to generate that profit and do it in a way where they're accepted by all the stakeholders. To me, that's, you know, that sounds very foreign. You know, taking care of your customers, yes, of course. Otherwise, you you won't be there and you won't be making money for for the long term. So so they are get a little thrown off. But maybe that's because, you know, uh, we think we have the same corporate governance, but but we don't. You know, the, the governance principles in these different countries looks a bit different between the UK, Germany, Sweden. And I'm, uh, for me, as you know, I'm an investor and own about, a, in our funds, about 100 companies. We, we've been for years talking about the long-term sustainable value creation. And what I think is the most, you know, I think it's dramatic over the last 24, 48 uh, uh, months. And maybe I should say something about you know, we used to talk about sustainable risk, you know, sustainability risks, and we had to mitigate them. Today's become a huge opportunity. So, you know, I'm not meeting a company today who doesn't want to pitch their little sustainability pitch. And the reason is equity markets are valuing sustainable companies very high. The best example I have is Tesla. You know, you, you get you, for Tesla, you can buy all of Volkswagen, you can buy all of Toyota, and you have five, six hundred billion dollars in your pocket. And that's a really, if you want a driver, if, if, if equity markets or market participants today see sustainability not as a huge risk, like a fantastic opportunity, because there's a lot of capital going in here, you're going to have the regulators in your back. They're going to work for you, not against you. Market has already realized that. You see it in valuations, and I think you see it across Europe. You know, maybe started in the Nordics, but today you see it in Italy and Germany and other countries. So we're, I'm, I'm very optimistic about this. I, I think we're going in the right direction. Uh, and I'm, well, just one more thing, Roger, and I'm gonna let you in, but um, we didn't hear much about owners, you know? And to me, corporate governance starts with owners. It starts with owners that are engaged and responsible. That's where it starts. Owners appoint, owners appoint directors, not the other way around. Yes. Well, I think maybe we're seeing a transition now in terms of who we define as the owners. You know, uh, I, I really gr agree with you. You know, the corporate governance systems are different. And, you know, when I look at the Nordic countries, I see some very long term oriented um, owners who are really committed to companies and who impart their values in, into the operations of companies. Um, and we see that also in the UK, for example, in family businesses, you know, that have been in the family for generations, they're not stock market listed, they have that very benevolent, um, you know, very uh, real focus on, on, on the culture of the organisation. Unfortunately, though, in, in global capital markets, 
I do think that there is an inherent short termism. Um, you know, I mean, what what is a liquid equity market there to do? It's there to allow people to buy and sell at will on a very short term basis, should they so desi desire to do. Um, many of them don't, but a lot of them do take take advantage of, of that, um, yeah. and that creates that creates pressures for companies. You know, there's this sort of ever present risk of you know, having your stock bought up by a short term investor um, or, you know, the, the CEO is feeling a pressure to to perform in the short term if they're going to actually benefit from their long term incentive plan. So and, and there's, the, we're not just talking actually about the stock market. I think you know our society is a pretty short term. I mean, our political systems think short term. Um, you know, people aren't going to be around. I mean, it's interesting, you know, to, to hear about these commitments being made at COP26, um, you know, for net zero in 2060, 2070. Of course, the people making them won't, won't be around by, by then. Um, so, you know, I, I, there, there is, and, and that, that's why also I think the private equity market exists. I mean, why, why do people want to stay private? Why do people want to go private? It's because they want to shield themselves from short, short term is pressure. So I, I, I don't think, although Sweden, I think, is a, a good example, the Nordic countries are a, provide a good example of how things can work well with benevolent owners. I think looking more broadly across the globe, there is a real issue of short termism. We're going to hear in panel two a bit more about the private equity model and, and where the benefits right. are, are, Roger. But, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we have to make a distinction. There's one thing we have to distinguish. One, one thing is that we have an equity market where you can trade shares and that makes it, you know, it makes it possible for you to own it for a day and then sell it. That's one thing. The other thing is how the corporation is actually run. You know, uh, and I think if you were to make a list of, of you know, institutional investors are big, becoming larger and larger owners all over the place. And actually, it, there's, you know, it's, it, the capital is starting to go to so few that that we can, you know, it's about four names and, and they're big owners in most companies around the world, uh, the vanguards and, and, and the black rocks of the world. And if you go and ask them if they're short term, they would say they're not because they run index funds and they are forever, you know, or at, at least they're forever as long as the company is in the index. Uh, so, so I have always have a hard time uh, seeing where this short termism comes from. Uh, it's probably there. You're probably right. Uh, sometimes I feel it's like it's management who, who gets, you know, get, they get too much driven by sell side analysts, what, what they have for projections for this quarter, and then they're going to try to make it or not. When people like us, we want you to run your company for the long term, for the long term sustainable value creation. And, and in my mind, that that you know that encompasses taking care of your employees. Um, today, there's there you know we have labor loss, uh, but there's such a massive competition for talent. So no one will just I'm sure EY they, they don't follow just the minimum labor law in, in uh, each country. They add on a lot of perks to get the best and the brightest. So so the systems I, you know to me it somehow works. But I think you're going back to I, I like engaged owners because I think and uh, I think they sort of empower the board uh, and we have a wonderful system which I'm not sure how many uh, uh, European countries have with the nominating committees you know the four or five largest shareholders gets together and we nominate the board and we make sure we get the composition that we think this company needs for its its uh, you know strategic growth agenda and the nominating committee which you know in the beginning people were like oh we're going to sit on it why should we do that there's some free rider problems in it but it's gotten yes we have the families that have owned their businesses for 100 years but we also have very engaged institutional owners and th that's through that little nomination committee that we've had for i don't know 15 20 years now this worked very well and it would be a good tip to to get your institutional owners more engaged in your companies Roger, th thanks, you. And Roger, we've we've heard a lot about um, the the benefits of engaged owners, and I think that is clear and a point well made. Just thinking about sort of the work that you've been doing recently on on this agenda, particularly on sustainability and achieving sustainable um, business objectives. What are you seeing companies, or what are you recommending that companies do to really accelerate this in governance terms? Yes. Well, I, I think you know that I put the 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 call for action into two piles. One is what we're asking of companies. And the other is what we're asking of policymakers. 
I mean, in terms of boards of directors, you know, our first ask is, is a very clear and obvious one, and that is um, sustainability and, the, and specifically the issue of climate change and how you get to net zero should be a central part of your, your strategizing and your corporate decision making, and you need to build it in, into that. And if you're a larger company, you probably almost certainly would want to have a sustainability subcommittee of the board. Um, so that and also that you actually define or make a commitment to reaching a net zero situation for your business by a particular date. You outline a clear roadmap for how you're going to get that there. Um, you disclose that and you communicate that to stakeholders and you you build a vision including not only, um, should we say, the, 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 the challenges of, of achieving that net zero situation, but also the opportunities you're going to, to grasp as an entrepreneurial business in terms of, of how to get there. So that, you know, that's the sort of first key one. Where I, I do worry, actually, um, more is, is re relating to the boards of SMEs. You know, SMEs, I think, well, what we found in, in our uh, polling research at the Institute of Directors is that SMEs have a real desire to play their part in achieving a sustainable future, but overwhelmingly they don't know how to do that. They don't have the in-house expertise and, and specialist know-how as a large company might have. And they're not being confronted by large institutional investors who are saying you're, you're going to have to change, unlike larger companies. They may, however, be confronted by um, larger customers um, as part of their supply chain. So I think lar larger companies have an important role to act, not only to think about how they themselves um, decarbonize, but really think about how that's transmitted down the supply chain. Um, and working in partnership with, with these uh, smaller companies. And I think, you know, we, we as IODs, but also working in partnership with government, you know, have a big job on our hands now to, you know, provide the training, the expertise, the advice, perhaps the certification processes which SMEs need in order to address the, this issue. So I suppose, Andrew, they're, they're the two big asks we have for companies. But mm -hmm. on the policy front, we're also asking for something which is rather um, similar to that of the proposal of the European Commission, was in that we do think company law should be changed, specifically directors' legal duties, to reflect more of a genuine stakeholder orientation. Our, our, our directors' fiduciary law framework is still living in the era of shareholder primacy, where the, the prime person, the prime actor to actually please is the shareholder. Um, we, we need actually now to have more of a bar balanced, pluralistic approach, I think, to, to stakeholders. And there's, there's actually a campaign in the UK called the Better Business Act campaign, which is trying to change Section 172 of the Companies Act, which is trying to get behind that. So that, that I think, will be a very important symbolic step to align business in, in a legal sense with what many are actually doing anyway. Thanks, Roger, on that. And just, I think uh, I really want to pick up on that last point about the sort of commission's proposals and the changing director's duties, because I suspect Euron will have a very different view on that. So I'll turn to him. But before that, I just want to say to the audience, please use the Q&A function if you want to ask any of the our panellists, our guests, um, Roger or Goran uh, a question, and, and I'll feed that in, and including commenting on this last point about the director's duties. Goran, do you, do you think that, um, do you agree with Roger? Do you think that we need uh, to change company law? No, I mean, we don't need to change Swedish company law. Maybe you need to change UK company law. I, I can't speak to that. Uh, on the director's duties from the EU, I think uh, the responses from Swedish investors, Swedish business and the Swedish government was clearly that's a bad idea. Uh, and that's because we're, we're pretty content with the system we have with the, with the company law that we, we uh, also complement with, uh, uh, you know, I'm on, the, I'm on the corporate governance board uh, where we do the, the code for the, uh, you know, listed companies. And, and we have taken in some, uh, you know, opened up in that, which most companies actually follow also in Sweden, very few uh, uh, do not, uh, you know, the, the right, you know, the right for the board already to include sustainability issues because it's also you know it's a license to operate I, I think every successful company knows i'm a part 
of this big global system. We have these challenges. We're going to be part of the solutions, just like we individuals will be. Um, so I don't feel that we need any change of any law. It's already there. Very interesting. I don't know if you read Swedish press, but one of the top, top um, uh, chairman who runs, he's the chairman of several of the big Swedish companies, was in the paper yesterday. And, and he, without any you know, changes in the law, talks about the need for the company to satisfy all its stakeholders. Uh, you know, when, when the business roundtable in the U.S. says, oh, you have to, you know, you have to look to your, your customers and take care of your employees. To me, that's like, well, it feels like we've been doing that for many, many years. The employees are on the boards so of Swedish companies and working together with the other directors to, to uh, you know, future-proof future the company so we can be successful long term. I think, so no, I think it's a bad idea. I think there are some very specific moments when what the law states becomes very important. Much of the time, you know, a good board will say, well, we're, we're trying to satisfy stakeholders and it's very hard to know whether they are or not, you know, what, what their priorities are. But there, there are specific moments when it does become important. One, for example, is a takeover situation. Um, and we've seen a number of these situations um, playing out in the UK over the summer. Um, where there have been takeover bids for certain UK companies, particularly those in the defence sector. And the, the directors of those boards have stated publicly that they feel they have no choice but to si simply accept the highest bid. Um, there, was, there was one in particular who was quoted in the media as saying, um, you know, if, if you want to take into account other considerations other than simply the share price, that's a role for government. Government has to think about that. I simply have to... Um, accept the highest bid. So in effect, what those directors think is, is, is that it's their job just to auction off the company to the highest bidder. And I, I don't think that that's what directors should be doing. I, I think direct, uh, the director in that situation should be thinking, who is going to be the best steward, the best owner of the company's assets? And therefore, there may be reasons not to accept the highest bid. Uh, because of the other plans that that, that bidder has, has for the company. So that, I think, is a key one. The other one, I think, is an executive remuneration because so many executive remuneration plans are just focused on sh total shareholder return, getting the share price from here to here. And I think going forward, absolutely, we, we need to have a much more um, balanced approach to executive pay, which really does take into account you know, the success in achieving net zero and decarbonizing the business and, and achieving all of those other non-financial uh, objectives and so that's a, that's another reason why i think this would be aside from being just a, a very symbolic thing and aligning company law with all of the other things we're trying to achieve actually um going forward um in terms of esg and sustainability i think would, would be very important just one point where I actually agree with you, Roger, uh, and that's um, remuneration, uh, which, I mean, it's one of the toughest things to do to get the right sort of incentive systems in place. But but even there, um, you know, we have some example now where we have tied the long term incentive programs uh, to ESG goals, you know, and, and uh, uh, there you can say, it, it's a nice way of doing it because you can say short term, yes, it must it might cost us a little bit uh, to to reach these new targets, but long term we're going to make savings and things like that. And we put up the targets. Uh, uh, this the one I'm thinking about is a real estate company. We're going to take down the uh, you know our real estate uses a lot of energy, so we're going to make them more energy efficient. But that's an investment up front, but it's going to take down the cost. Uh, further down and and now the management has uh, long their long lti tied to how they will reduce the energy consumptions of those buildings on you know given to the shareholders to vote on at the agm uh, so we can do that already in I the existing I, structure i think i think that shareholders can be a tremendous force for good you know we've seen so we've seen actually during this agm season a big upsurge actually in, in shareholder resolutions on things like climate and ESG being passed. Um, there was that tremendous landmark um, uh, event when a, a, a tiny hedge fund owning, uh, I think, 0.02% or something like that of Exxon stock 
has managed to um, change three members of the of the Exxon board. So shareholders can have a tremendous power. And, you know, even the likes of BlackRock, Vanguard are, are becoming much more active now. But let's not forget that the shareholder community is not is a very heterogeneous one. There are di very different types of investors out there with different objectives. Um, some benevolent, some are out there to uh, to drive and catalyze short term shareholder value creation, you know, by by activist methods or other methods. Um, and, you know, that that's that's really the, the, the danger for this kind of shareholder agenda. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, being part, yeah. of, sorry, sorry. Being part yeah. of the asset management industry today, I mean, there, yes, there are activists out there and their hedge funds in there for the short term. But if you look at the asset management industry today, I mean, ESG and sustainability, everybody's talking about it. And, and there's a lot of money going into that kind of strategies, whether it's, you know, non this or it's going to be a transformational thing. Uh, so, so capital formation is there and it seems like the whole industry is, is behind it. So I think it would be, you know, very hard to find a traditional institutional investor who would say, you know, we're not pro ESG, the whole industry is there. I want to give thanks to both of you. I want to give some time to the questions from the audience to really bring them in and, and get them engaged. So um, we've had a lot of questions. So thanks, thanks for those. Um, just one comment from Catherine DeLong before I move on to the questions um, on the point of about uh, board compositions. So if I'm reading the, her comment correctly, I think that uh, she's suggesting that a change in mindset will go a long way to to uh, help boards address and, and do what they need to do in terms of um, integrating sustainability as much as skills, diversity, etc. But uh, actually, it's just an attitude. Um, some questions about SMEs coming through. So um, I'll maybe take a couple of them uh, at the same time and then the, either of you can decide how to address them. So Thomas Tim Smith from the FRC lab has asked, how should regulators support SMEs in moving to fuller uh, ESG disclosure? And then an anonymous uh, guest has said, how do we make uh, sure SMEs have the tools to build capacity and transform their businesses so they can become or be classified as sustainable providers to larger companies? So how are they gonna get, you know, meet the procurement criteria um, for, for larger companies? Is, is this the government's responsibility or is it big companies themselves? Well, companies I, themselves? I do think, I think that it's, it's a partnership actually between, between the various actors in the system. Um, I think you know, a part of it is going to be about education. Um, I think we need to be very careful though about not uh, disproportionately imposing a lot of big company requirements and regulation on, on SMEs because the, you know, the, that that wouldn't be wouldn't be appropriate and will kind of uh, I think would be especially negative given that all our surveys suggest they, they are very eager and willing to embrace the, the sustainability challenge. I think that one way I mean things like for example government procurement processes embedding these kind of ESG and sustainability uh, uh, criteria into them are important. I think though that some some forms of standard some a um, small company, easy to um, undertake, and um, some government endorsed standards um, or, or kite mark um, of a, a process that's going on in an SME or an achievement that has been made at an SME in terms of sustainability would be very useful. Um, I have to say that we at the IOD as an organization um, have adopted something like that. Uh, there's an organization which I'll, I'll name them because they're, uh, they're doing a good job. They're called Planet Mark. And they have examined our carbon footprint over the last couple of years. And they're doing that on, on an annual basis. And we then report that in our annual report and accounts. And I think what we need are, are those type of certifications, which are appropriate and proportionate to SMEs, they could really help. Very good. Joran, do you want to comment on that? Or? No, I, I think uh, they will. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would uh, hopefully the larger companies can help the, the smaller. Uh, they are, I agree, they are not as far advanced. Uh, uh, but even for them, for the smaller companies, it's, it's a reality to, to adapt. Uh, I have a beautiful little story uh, because there is institutional money in SMEs too. And we come to a small sub supplier who's, uh, uh, you know, they're sourcing 90% from Asia four or five years ago. And they sell to the bigger corporates and they had done nothing to secure their suppliers that they were, you know, conducting their business in a good way and have nothing in place. 
And if you think about that, it's like, well, guys, you know, in a couple of years, your client is going to come to you and, and say, how do you secure your, your supply chain? And if you can't show them that, that you, you know, you have a code of conduct and you actually audit that, uh, you're not going to sell anything. Uh, so I think uh, actually <laughs> institutional owners can play a little part there. We see what the big ones do and, and transfer that knowledge when we go out and talk to them and says, you know, for us, these things are important. So you better adapt because we want you to be in there for the long term. Thank you. A number of questions. I'm going to try and get, because we've got about four minutes left just to try and sort of summarize them. But a lot of questions really about what do companies need to do, both small and large, to, to prepare for, for the changing regulatory landscape that we're going to see coming out of the EU, whether it be the, the governance um, reforms that uh, Salah was talking about or the, the implementation of the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive with full ESG disclosures. What's any practical, practical um, suggestions for companies that are thinking about that right now? I mean, my, my view is that the, the best companies are fulfilling the, these proposed requirements anyway. I mean, I think any reasonable company will be trying to understand its supply chain. It will be doing due diligence. Um, it won't just see outsourcing as a, as a way to you know, offload its problems uh, out of sight and out of mind. So, I mean, you know, it, it makes sense to, 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 to do that um, if you haven't done it, done it already. Um, and as for um, you know, reporting, change reporting requirements, uh, you know, again, I think you know, any good company will have done, uh, undertaken a stakeholder mapping exercise um, internally or in terms of their board, will have, have, from that stakeholder mapping exercise, will have created some form of appropriate stakeholder engagement plan or strategy, which will include a communication strategy, a reporting strategy. I mean, my view is that we're going to a world in the future where different stakeholders probably de need different communication approaches that, you know, the kind of one size fits all world of the annual report and the AGM, um, which was primarily aimed at shareholders, but now is sort of everyone is welcome. That, 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 needs, that needs to transition towards a much more tailored approach to, to different stakeholders. So yeah, but what my piece of advice would be to companies large and small, you know, think about your main stakeholders and, and work out an appropriate um, engagement strategy and communication strategy. We certainly agree with that in our report. Goran, any final remarks? Thank you, Roger. Any final remarks for you before I, I kind of wind up and hand back to Irena? No, that I would say to the regulators, please keep it simple for the SMEs uh, and to the SMEs themselves, start early because it's going to come. <laughs> Very good. That's simple advice. Apologies. Thank you very much, both of you. Apologies to, to those questions. I didn't get round to, uh, to to putting your question to either Roger or Goran. Um, a lot of food for thought there. I, I think both um, both Roger and Goran really um, talked about how the, the remarks where even speakers had resonated with them. This is definitely the right agenda, but I heard some, I think, key takeaways for me were um, uh, that business leaders are doing this already. There was a difference of opinion on, on the need to change company law and directors' duties, that remuneration and incentives definitely need to be aligned, and that uh, engaged owners also play a fundamental part. So I'll leave you with those, those thoughts, um, and back to you, Irena, and good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you to uh, Goran and Roger. Yeah, it was quite a warming up, uh, the audience, <laughs> and you did a good setting um, a stage for the next two panels. Uh, so we are starting now with our first panel on corporate governance as a tool to embed sustainability with distinguished guests. Uh, the panel will be moderated by the member of the European Parliament, Heidi Hetla. So please, Heidi, the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, you need to start my video, I'm afraid. Could you do that? Um, I just hope the, the team behind the scenes uh, will manage it um, to allow you to be there. Okay, okay. Here, okay. Hey. go it ahead. It's a little odd. Do you see me now? Okay. Yes, yes, we yes. see you now, Heidi. Yes, it's, uh, I'm very honored to, to, to be invited to um, moderate this panel. And I, I was fascinated by many things that were said uh, uh, before during the first hour. So now we're going to discuss how corporate governance indeed is and can be a tool uh, to embed sustainability in, in corporate activities. 
And um, uh, of course, uh, we as uh, policymakers in the European Parliament and the EU member states, talking to a very, very large number of, of stakeholders, we are quite excited about the uh, initiative on sustainable corporate governance that it's uh, underway and that uh, also the uh, so-called mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence will be a part of it. So um, Sala Sastamoinen has opened up a little bit uh, what we can expect. Uh, and I understand that still it's a big chance that we will get the commission's proposal on the 8th of, uh, of December. So let's see. Now, um, um, I have a very uh, distinguished uh, group of uh, panelists here. Um, I will uh, briefly introduce them to you and then we will go to the debate. So Lena Linnaima uh, is Secretary General of Directors Institute Finland and she's also, I think since April, Chair of ECODA, the European Confederation of Directors Associations. Uh, Lena is a true expert of good corporate governance and she's been an ardent promoter of women's leadership in, in the corporate world. Uh, then we have Elisabeth Gambert. Uh, she's director for CSR and International Affairs at the French Association of Private Enter Enterprises, as we know, AFET. She's also co-chair of the Corporate Reporting Working Group of European Issuers, uh, and so on, a very <laughs> distinguished um, uh, uh, functions, indeed. Then we have Susanna Arus, um, who is an EU Public Affairs um, and Communications Manager at Frank Bold a public interest law organization that works to solve social and environmental problems. Um, Susanna is responsible for the advocacy strategy and relations with EU institutions and external stakeholders. Then we have Rachel Johnson. Rachel is uh, head of risk management and corporate uh, governance at uh, ACCA, um, uh, producing thought leadership uh, for members and partners around the world. And for two decades, uh, she has experience of creating a thought-led leadership content on a number of uh, financial topics, uh, such as risk management, responsible investing, sustainable finance, regulatory change management, and corporate governance. And we have John Bendermacher. John is chief audit executive of the European Group in Brussels, and John leads their international, uh, sorry, internal audit function. And in the past, uh, he has been Chief Audit Executive for ABN AMRO and some other Dutch financiers since 1999. So, uh, Lena, uh, I would be very happy to hear from you. What do you see happening on the ground and uh, what is happening in the boardrooms? Are we seeing uh, sustainability subcommittees as was suggested by previous speakers? Um, and uh, do the, does ECODA uh, train uh, directors to, to truly speak sustainability and learn to look at the, the, their uh, function and uh, the, the purpose of the co corporate, uh, their corporation in a new way? So, Lena, please take the floor. And I should ask all of you to, to, to keep uh, your first introduction to three to four minutes because then we have, have a chance. Uh, I have a chance to ask you some specific questions as a follow up. And then afterwards, we can have an exchange between all of you and, and with the audience, I hope. So Lena, please take the floor. Thank you, Heidi. I think we are all seeing tremendous change on company boards at the directors' institutes in different European countries. And certainly a lot I am seeing changing in Finland. Uh, well, you asked specifically about sustainability committees. That is not something that uh, is happening in all listed companies. It is a little bit sector-wise. On the other hand, what we are seeing that the remuneration committees, some of them are changing into personnel committees to have a wider scope uh, covering all employees. So many things are, are happening, but it is not the same change in every company, every sector, in, and of course, depending on the, on the ownership structure. And um, definitely uh, sustainability is on the board, board agenda current, currently. And uh, when I look at the Directors Institute Finland, we have 750 members covering every listed company in this country. Of course, our members are very, very aware that it is a core strategic issue to work on, on sustainability issues. There will be perhaps taxes, uh, tariffs, uh, uh, limitations or use of materials. But another thing is that how about the SMEs? 
Well, one of the things that is happening currently is that the large companies are setting their targets. And of course, <laughs> there is, is the effect that will happen, happen on the SMEs and not all of the directors in SMEs are actually understanding that the change is happening. It, it is happening, but some of them are not yet really aware. I, I train regularly uh, also SME, SME directors. Of course, our membership is mostly, mostly for large companies, but I participate in, in trainings and I organize workshops regarding the, is your board ready uh, for, for future challenges? And very many of them say yes, or, because, for example, a bank has give, given the, them a paper to fill in and they have understood that they're not going to get a loan. So th there are very many uh, ways how, how awareness is being raised. But then I find, in, find in these trainings that some directors in SME say that this has not been on, on their agenda. So we definitely need training. And I would say that ECODA covering quite many countries all over Europe would be a very good source for, for tra trainings because some of the countries we are doing it ourselves. I have a strong institute. For example, our memberships in our member survey last, um, last summer said when I asked for the most popular themes for next year, sustainability was number one. So it's, it's a, a real natural issue for them. It's not something si si in, in the side, but I'm not sure that is happening in every country and every company. So, so I think uh, uh, speaking now for ECODA, we could have a possibility to work more in some countries if there, if there were, for example, a budget line, line, line for that. Whereas in my country, I know we're doing it on, on our own. So this is some, some of the primary, primary thoughts. And there, there is, of course, a lot, for example, remuneration issues that I would like to discuss later on. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's very exciting also to go into the remuneration issue. So, um, uh, thank you for that. Um, then I would like to invite Elisabeth Gambert to take the floor uh, and like to hear from you uh, what are the challenges for large companies to implement due diligence on supply chains and how does this relate to sustainable corporate governance and directors duties? So please share your experience and your, your understanding of what's happening and what will happen. So Elisabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Heidi, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to share with you some of the practical insights uh, large French companies have gained from the implementation of the French Duty of Care Act of 2017 and also from the Pact Law of 2019. So let me start by due diligence on supply chains. Uh, this is certainly one of the most difficult issues, and this is because global supply chains are very complex. Three examples to illustrate the challenges we are facing. First, uh, large companies have several thousands of direct suppliers, sometimes up to 100,000 first tier suppliers. And each of these, again, has 500 or more suppliers and subcontractors, which means that only the second tier representing uh, typically 500,000 or up to several million of companies is practically impossible to control every part of this entire chain. The second challenge is that some suppliers are much bigger than, than our customers, uh, uh, than, than, than the customers, and, and they refuse to cooperate or to respond to audit requests. And third, some suppliers are controlled or imposed by failing or purely uh, governed states. So this is why we believe that the future EU requirements cannot reasonably cover the entire value chain. Uh, they should be limited to the company's sphere of control with a risk-based approach, allowing to prioritize and focus on the ground. Therefore, due diligence should focus on very specific and clearly defined human rights and local environmental risks. And we also need a fair level playing field as regards the scope. Uh, including non-EU companies operating in the EU and also enterprises owned and, uh, or controlled by the states. Now, how does this relate to corporate governance? AFEP fully supports the concept of sustainable corporate governance, uh, which companies have already integrated into the strategies because as uh, our previous speaker, Goran said, if they don't uh, 
uh, if they don't, they won't succeed in the long run. Uh, and this integration is declined in several ways, such as enhanced dialogue with stakeholders, the consideration of CSR risks at board level, or the inclusion of CSR criteria in executive remuneration. Let me briefly uh, present some of our convictions about successful so sustainable corporate governance. First, there needs to be a tone from the top, meaning a clear commitment at the highest governance level. This is essential to be credible and to effectively implement uh, and also send a strong signal to employees, to suppliers, to contractors, etc., cetera, um, that they all respect the company's policy. And this policy may then take the form of a code of conduct, of an ethics charter, of supplier code of conduct, of sustainable procurement charter or anti-corruption codes, whatever. Uh, second, stakeholder consultation is a good practice. Most AFIP members have established a form of stakeholder dialogue. Sometimes they have created formal stakeholder committees. However, corporate governance and corporate strategy uh, is a prerogative of the board and dialogue with stakeholders is not necessarily conducted at board level. So there are probably as many ways of identifying stakeholders and their interests as there are companies. So they may organize stakeholder dialogue at the local level, at the centralized level, uh, on themes, on geographical zones, on cross-cutting approaches. So we really need flexibility uh, how to involve external stakeholders. And uh, therefore it is very unrealistic or it would be even dangerous to require boards to uh, balance, I quote, the interests of all stakeholders, because this would mean that each and every board decision would have to be documented in order to be able to justify the reasons why one of uh, the interests has been prioritized over another, and, and all interests cannot always be put on a legal footing, so there would be stalemate legal uncertainty and we think this is not the, 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 the good way um, to deal with this. So in France, uh, boards of directors have been taking into account uh, social and environmental aspects of companies' activities uh, to promote long-term value creation. And this has been done well before the adoption of the PACT law in 2019. So the PACT law enshrined a practice which had de facto existed before without seeking to define what the company's interest, l'intérêt social is. Uh, this will be left to, to case law again. In practice, this requires great flexibility because companies' um, interests depend on the changing characteristics of their activity, the environment of, of each company. And uh, I will uh, finish by a, a short remark on uh, director's expertise because this has been mentioned in the introduction. We totally agree that the board of directors should be committed to sustainability issues, uh, which are relevant for the company, but in order to perform their duties, they have to have a, a comprehensive picture of the company. They need to have a wide range of skills and expertise uh, which go beyond sustainability. Sustainability is one of them. And we think it's not, um, um, it's not uh, suitable to impose a specific uh, uh, CSR requirement, uh, expertise requirement uh, as a part of the recruitment process even if de facto it will be an important point. So to conclude, uh, on due diligence, we support a legislative EU duty of care. On sustainable corporate governance, we think the EU should limit itself to a few very high level principles, similar to the French pact law. And for the rest, there is CSRD with the transparency provisions. And uh, there is also soft law, uh, which is best suited to um, uh, to deal with uh, corporate governance because it is able to adapt and respond uh, more easily to the fast changing challenges we face. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, so uh, in the interest of time and debate, uh, I would uh, ask you to be a little more compact in your, your replies because we only have 20 minutes for the first round. So um, I turn to Susanna. Susanna, um, uh, all current EU initiatives are clearly interconnected and you know them all. So sustainable corporate governance is linked to the CSRD and the sustainable finance. 
So how, in your view, uh, could the European Commission help SMEs on the future reporting requirements that could affect them as part of the Due Diligence Act? So please take the floor for three to four minutes. Thanks, Ms. Halpella, and thanks to the organizers of this event for inviting Frank Bolt to participate in the panel discussion. As you may have seen in the program, a different name, I'm actually filling in for Philip Gregor, who is head of responsible company section and who unfortunately could not participate today for personal reasons. I'm the communications and new public affairs manager at Frank Bolt and also coordinator of the Alliance for Corporate Transparency, which is a civil society led initiative currently gathering over 20 leading NGOs working on corporate sustainability. And Frank Bolt is also now part of the EFRAC project task force working to develop draft European sustainability reporting standards. But we have been working for over a decade to build consensus on the best ways to incorporate sustainability and respect for human rights in corporate governance and business management. Throughout the multiple research that we've implemented in the Alliance for Corporate Transparency since 2018, we have provided extensive data and evidence-based recommendations to further develop the legal, framework, the legal framework for corporate sustainability reporting in the EU. And our research, together with proof from other studies, have shown that there is a pro problematic lack of relevant and meaningful data on policies, risks, impacts, targets, and companies' due diligence process. Now, the current CSRD proposal is set to address these gaps identified in the implementation of the previous EU non-financial reporting directive and mandatory EU standards are crucial for the success uh, of this reform in order to clarify what needs to be reported at general and sector specific level, as well as provide relevant accompanying methodologies. Because without the right insights from companies, it will not be possible to achieve the objective set in the renewed sustainable finance strategy and the European Green Deal. Now, the EU was the first to incorporate the concept of impact in accounting law. We want to recognize EU's leadership, especially concerning the double materiality principle, which has also been further incorporated in the sustainable finance agenda and related legislation. The reform of this directive and the accompanying standards will be developed ensuring full policy coherence with existing legislation, as well as the alignment with EU public goals on climate, deforestation, biodiversity or human rights, and drawing from international standards and guidances. Now, this consistency also concerns with the upcoming EU Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative, expected to be presented uh, this December, and which is set to tackle both the lack of a European legal framework for corporate human rights and environmental due diligence, and also look into fostering sustainability and long-term thinking in corporate governance. Now, the UN developed 10 years ago the concept of due diligence, and since then, it has been supported by robust OECD guidance aimed at helping companies to identify and address their impacts on people and planet. The concept has already been endorsed by sustainability leaders among companies, investors, reporting frameworks, governments, and also the European Union. However, companies can still struggle to understand what they are supposed to do and disclose due to the proportionate nature of this concept, lack of clarity in law, and also diverging uh, stakeholder demands. Today, while a majority of companies are ready to report on high-level commitments to respect human rights, the research of the Alliance for Corporate Transparency on 1,000 European companies showed that the actual due diligence process was disclosed by only 20% of companies. So while due diligence is important to determine, to determine what the company needs to address, the CSRD and sustainability standards will help describe how the company should report on it. And now just looking more specifically on, uh, into SMS reporting and finalizing my, remar my remarks, until now they have been left out from the sustainability, sustainability reporting obligations. However, as it was mentioned by Roger uh, Barker before and other speakers, uh, this will change dramatically as European banks and investors, as well as companies at the top of value chains, will be rapidly realigning their strategies to avoid risks. Um, so SMEs form the majority of the clients and suppliers, so that's why it's important that small businesses understand the implications of such changes and also the role that they can play in this debate. We think that if SMEs are not included, they will be at a disadvantage compared to larger competitors and also listed SMEs that will be instead covered by the new rules. And there are many SMEs that find themselves in sectors that are facing technological and regulatory changes. So they need to secure finance for transformation, and that includes in energy, construction, metallurgy, or agriculture, uh, or agricultural sectors. So to be competitive and secure future public and private funding, 
SMEs understand, they understand that they need to invest into their own transformation, yet harnessing these opportunities will also depend on the SME's ability to provide the right data on sustainability, always considering this under the uh, European Union's proportionate uh, approach. Thanks, Heide, back to you. Hi, thanks a lot, Susanna. Um, I think you made a very elegant argument uh, why SMEs should not be left uh, behind in this uh, new uh, legislation. So uh, I'll turn now to Rachel Johnson and um, it's been really a pleasure to see how uh, involved and engaged uh, the auditors um, uh, and accounting uh, profession in general is in this uh, whole discussion. And so what is the auditor's role in, indeed in all this? And um, how can auditors uh, support boards to shape their sustainability strategy? And let me also find out from you, um, uh, can, are you also in the position as auditors to, to advise uh, companies to, to avoid um, uh, let's say greenwashing or or um, unfounded uh, claims about the sustainability. So uh, I'll give the floor to you now, Rachel. Thank you, Heidi. Um, yeah, that was a few questions intertwined into one, but I'll try to address it as quickly and and. Um, uh, specifically as possible. Um, so to start, the audit committee has um, really taken on a more uh, facilitation role and is there to connect the dots because the risks we face, financial and non-financial, are in fact intertwined. This is why audit committees have had to become a lot more agile, a lot more frequent, and a lot more dynamic in both supporting and challenging senior management. To provide effective risk oversight and help the management navigate these fast changing um, times, <clears throat> audit committees also need to ask direct targeted questions to understand what management is doing. They need to innovate and consider new and hard to find expertise when addressing key ESG issues that matter most to their organization and its stakeholders and indeed be better at, at prioritizing them. So this requires a high degree of judgment at a time when added uncertainty is making their responsibilities more challenging. And I might add that that's also given the varied estimates and assumptions that, that they are dealing with when it comes to creating metrics for the many intangible risks. As Julie noted earlier, the evolving um, rules and expectations of reporting about sustainability and providing assurance for that has required organizations to really rethink the internal controls that need to be reviewed in accordance with them. It is the responsibility of the audit committee to, to drive this and make sure everyone top down and bottom up understands what these accounting standards are there for. To me, this really is the backbone of any sustainability journey, no matter what the organization is, private, public, and SMEs. Some of our members have emphasized the importance of knowing what is appropriate for maintaining effective internal control over financial reporting, which as we know is part of the US Sarbanes-Oxley Act, but they know also how this applies to non-financial reporting. As companies in, in, in the EU are facing their own regulatory change, we cannot underestimate, as we've been discussing today, how crucial it is for the board and, and committees to know inside and out the management's process for managing this, and indeed the transition to net zero emissions and the risk and opportunity that this presents. Risk is never the responsibility of one individual or team. It is about building a mindset, fostering a robust culture, and this is where the audit committee's collaboration with the board and management becomes so critical in putting such values and goals at the heart of the organization, while also providing assurance that the information can be trusted and put into practice. It must understand how emerging risks are addressed through the organization strategy and investment, who the owner is, are they making well-informed decision, and how risks are taken into account in disclosures. The effectiveness of the audit committee really boils down to execution in this respect. Audit committees must ensure the right processes and procedures are in place to support activities in all possible scenarios and ensure the organization is prepared for the consequences of those. Audit committees must be brave in this respect because they need to initiate some of the most uncomfortable conversations in order to collect the right information, the truthful information that the organization needs in order to make sound decisions. And these discussions must be ongoing. This is where I think the true tests lie. 
because you can have the best audit in the world, but if you don't have the relationships and the line of communications needed to get to the bottom of the issues, then you won't have what it takes to be trusted and therefore be effective. So audit committees need to always be present. They need to maintain that two-way street of communicating to make sure all questions are asked. The relationships are constantly in building and improving mode. And I'll end on saying, Getting to know the people, the stakeholders, is just as important as getting to know the risks. It is a journey. And I'll definitely talk more about recent developments in converging um, accounting standards and what is some of the reform and proposals um, on the role of audit as well in the, um, in the later discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, I think it's uh, great uh, to understand indeed that uh, it takes uh, to build a new mindset and in interaction and communication within the company and to outside as well. So let me turn to John Bendermach now. Uh, concerning uh, board members, uh, board members obviously do not work isolated alone and they do not operate in any kind of a vacuum. So. Uh, what would be the role to elaborate uh, inter of internal auditors to help boards to identify risks and opportunities? So what would you say to this, please? Well, thank you, uh, <coughs> Heidi, for that interesting question. And also thank you for inviting me as the chairman of ECIIA, representing more than 48,000 internal auditors in, in Europe. And also thank you for having me as a man, because I noticed that I'm the only man in this panel. So that's on diversity. That's just right, isn't it? Um, well, looking at internal audit, I think in general, I would say that internal audit sees itself as an important element of good governance. Eh? And, and nevertheless, not every country mentions internal audit already in its corporate governance codes. And that would be the first comment I would like to make. Nevertheless, if you look at the risk assessments that we see all over Europe, eh, ESG is one of the main risks also observed by internal audit. And if you look at the role that internal audit normally has, uh, independent and objective audits to provide reasonable assurance and insight uh, to the boards and senior management on achieving their strategic object objectives, uh, then uh, ESG is, is, is just a part of those strategic objectives, of course. Uh, if management has uh, an aim to, to have sustainable corporate governance, sustainable finance, or comply with some ESG or GRI standards or any law or regulation in that respect, in fact, it is a normal control cycle in our view. And so management decides on which standard it wants to uh, comply with, sets the objectives, performs a risk analysis, decides on its risk appetite, and then decides on the risk response. And then a risk management comes in, compliance comes in, we come in uh, and we look at the policies and procedures, monitor the, the daily uh, occurrence of them. And, and basically that, that's it. So what can internal audit do in that respect? And, and it depends a little bit on the maturity of the risk management function, I, I, I must say, because normally they are the advocate of the change. Yeah, but if risk management would be less mature, internal audit can play that role uh, from the start. And also internal audit can audit, let's say, the development program and implementation program, yeah, the sufficiency of the policies and procedures developed, yeah, the clearness of KPIs, yeah, the deliverables uh, that the project comes up with, the business readiness yeah, to adopt them and adapt to them. And also the monitoring procedures from the first and the second line and that normally would be in place had to, to, to accompany the policies and procedures. And of course, we can audit the embedding and the execution on top of, of course, the monitoring by the first and second line. And we can even audit the culture change that really will be needed for companies to go into a more ESG-like and corporate governance mode. We can also look at, at internal reporting and even at external reporting. And I know that for external reporting, normally um, boards look at an external uh, auditor, but I think it's, it's, it's very good that internal audit has a very important role there as well. And then I, I, I'm talking about the reporting, completeness, correctness, consistency, timeliness, and transparency. So in one word, the reliability and high quality, not only external, but certainly also internal, had to manage this whole, this whole area. And already now, uh, I think uh, even before companies moving into a very conscious uh, journey, uh, we can already provide insight on, on adverse culture and behavior that we see during our audits. And also now many internal audit functions already audit governance, culture and behavior, strategy control cycles, supply, supply chains, 
and the remuneration. So big parts of this new um, uh, wave are already in there. So to conclude and, and be short, if it is about saving the planet, we should avoid Hollywood reporting. And to avoid that, we really need clear definitions and interpretations of them, clear KPIs and non-financial metrics and expected controls. We need a clear reporting format and reporting standards. And we also need to have the discussion on the level of assurance. What is reasonable? What is possible? Yeah, because some objectives are quite hard, others are more soft. And without proper standards and without uh, measurable KPIs, it will probably only be about the process. And there I would like to warn because uh, you know the saying, the, the surgery was successful, but the patient died and we should not, not have that risk. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you indeed very much. Um, I think um, directly from uh, what you have said, I would like to invite you all to, to answer um, from your point of views. Um, what do you think is, um, is the, the need to um, address the, the director's duties in the forthcoming EU legislation? And uh, perhaps um, I'll add another question here so you can choose what you want to answer. Uh, would you see that remuneration of directors would have to be more linked uh, to sustainability targets? Um, I, I've heard uh, opinions in favor and against, but it is my understanding that it is actually not really uh, a dominating uh, uh, thing at the moment. So there could, should be improvement in my view, but what is the best way? Do, does the corporate governance need to take this up? Uh, does it have to be uh, linked to director's duties? So please um, uh, let me turn to Lena on this. Thank you, Heidi, and first about the legislation on director's duties. Of course, when I look at this from the Finnish point of view, we have um, we, our company's law is not very old. It is very precise on, on liabilities and there are possibilities to sue for, for damages. So, so I don't see much need there for exact uh, liability uh, leg legislation. And on the, on the other hand, when I think of the sustainability issues, listed companies especially are, are very, very much bound to the corporate governance codes, which are a very flexible manner, manner of making change. Uh, as, as you know, Heidi, both you and I, we have worked very much to promote women on boards and that this is, this is how, how it's happened on the, on the Finnish listed, listed companies, seeing that, uh, that it was through the corporate governance code. So it can be a powerful tool, so that should not be forgotten. But I, I recognize that there may be countries where the Companies Act is older and, and might not be as suitable a tool. So that is something that it is good to also remember that that uh, there are different 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 uh, governance systems, different company laws, and when the European Commission, European Union is working on it, what is suitable for all countries, and this is go not going to be an easy task because, of course, also the different uh, governance systems uh, systems the two two tier fours and one tier fours and what, what, whatever anyway and then to the remuneration we are working at at directors is is it Finland very much with remuneration top, topics and and we partner with remuneration consultants and what we are hearing from them that they are getting now very many assignments from companies to add uh, sustainability criteria to, to, mm -hmm. to their programs. And when you're saying that it's not that much seen, yes, of course, it's true because in the past, it was not that usual. Of course, some in some business sectors such as construction, there were safety issues, which you definitely need to have there in the criteria, et cetera, et cetera. But, but to have, let's say, climate change system uh, and, and that sort of sustainability issues, that is happening actually now. And, and, and uh, I, I thought that the scene would be a little bit further. I, I sat on a jury where we went through all the remuneration reports of Finnish listed companies. And there is, there was, but that reflected last year, 2020, because reporting is reflecting the past. So there was a handful of them. And as, as I'm discussing with the remuneration consultants, I'm relatively confident that next year, and, and, and the year after that, there's going to be a lot more because there is very much talk about it. The, the, those events that we 
organize at the directors is they are actually very popular. So this is something that that uh, that concerns very much directors, but I'm not saying it happens in every company and every country. Mm -hmm. is, is there awareness raising on the, on these topics? And of course, we in Finland, we have investors, large investors, also foreign investors requiring sustainability criteria uh, to be put to put. Mm -hmm. And that is something when, when a large investor I can mean Sebian, for example, from, from Sweden, several fin Finnish one, uh, investors are interested in this. So this is something that is a very strong tool that the investors are requiring it. And, and in some countries, maybe the companies, if they're not awake now, they will have a rude awakening <laughs> pretty soon when their investors will, will find this, uh, this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena. So I hear that um, things are moving. Uh, Elizabeth, would you uh, see that uh, there could be some uh, changes in corporate governance and that it would also be a part of the, the new EU-wide legislation uh, uh, touching duties and remuneration? Please give us your view. Yes, so as I said on uh, legislation, we, we really think uh, the EU should uh, limit itself to very high principles on, on uh, remuneration. Uh, uh, in fact, the Shareholder Rights Directive has already introduced long-term perspectives regarding remuneration, and, and so we think this, this should be enough as a principle, and then corporate governance codes uh, can, can go further, such as the French corporate governance codes, which uh, recommends to introduce at least one ESG criteria for the variable pay, uh, variable part of remuneration. And uh, we also have the High Committee of Corporate Governance in France, uh, which has given some you know, explanations on this, uh, on this uh, variable part of remuneration to say it must also include environmental criteria. So that, that gives climate change, of course, a very specific place in this context. And uh, the criteria should be clearly uh, defined, relevant, and uh, integrate uh, the, the, the ESG issues which are uh, important for the company. So uh, it's not enough to just say, uh, you know, refer to, to a CSR policy in general, it has to be precise. So I think uh, th this is, uh, this is uh, a good solution. And in France, we have a very high percentage of companies from the SPF uh, 120 who have introduced these G criteria in the remuneration of the executive uh, directors. I think it is 32% um, of the total criteria for awarding annual compensa compensation of, uh, of the CEOs. So that's, that's, that's quite a, a good, a good uh, result, I think. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Elizabeth, for your, your view. Susanna, how do you and Frank Bold see this question? Uh, what to do with the director's duties part of the future legislation and remuneration? Indeed, thanks, uh, Heidi. Um, I'd like to first start by noting that both corporate due diligence and sustainability reporting both require effective governance and oversight from the company's senior management and the board. And this is especially important concerning sustainability risks and impacts that are connected to the company's core business model and where boards need to engage in key strategic decision or financial planning. So we expect that the upcoming Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative uh, will include key elements to clarify how the board fulfills its responsibilities to oversee sustainability, connect existing processes, and contribute to align incentives that support responsible and unsustainable corporate management. There have been um, different attempts to incorporate uh, sustainability in company law through conceptual changes or references to corporate purpose, but we have seen that these have not led to meaningful change. Um, right now, we have already the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights that include implicit engagement and responsibilities for directors. And we also have existing disclosure obligations in the European Union that involve the identification of relevant risks and impacts connected to the business model of a, of a company. However, we still see that sustainability information is uh, often not properly incorporated in business decision making. So for instance, the uh, research that I mentioned before um, on 1,000 European companies showed that less than 15% uh, out of them 
were disclosing how they integrate sustainability considerations into core business strategy, board discussions, or performance incentives. So that's why our recommendations focus on clarifying procedural obligations within existing directors' duties and corporate governance frameworks across the European Union. We hope that the Commission will include an explicit requirement for boards to oversee and discuss the results of the, of the due diligence and the materiality determination that already takes place within the sustainability reporting uh, process. We think that directors should use this information to approve a corporate strategy that fully integrates sustainability and specifies measurable targets and concrete plans to meet, uh, to meet this objective. And I think that this resonates with what other speakers have been saying uh, during the discussion today. There are multiple studies that have shown that transparency is not enough and voluntary regimes are not enough. So we believe that actually the combination of transparency and governance incentives together with the push from responsible investors, this will elevate sustainability matters among board priorities whilst still granting companies considerable flexibility on in how they uh, do this. And as you've asked as well on, on executive remuneration, we've heard uh, by other speakers as well, their directors, they are expected to, to, to lead and, and to establish a long-term sustainability strategy for the company. However, too often the remuneration is linked to the share price and does not reflect um, the intrinsic uh, enterprise uh, value. Um, and this can lead to short-term focus on financial performance only. So we actually think that yes, remuneration can be a powerful tool to uh, set impactful behavioral incentives within a company. We hope that the Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative would look into setting effective incentives to encourage directors to pursue a sustainable and long-term uh, value creations. This for, is, this, for instance, could be um, alignment of a significant proportion of the variable remuneration with the sustainable, sustainability targets set by the company. Thank you, Susanna. And Rachel, how do you see this question? You're mute. We don't see, um, we see you, Rachel. Yes, now, please. My, my mouse was being a bit fickle, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, to be honest, um, accountancy professionals come into to, um, play here in, in so many different directions from, I mentioned earlier in the audit committees, um, in internal audit, audit firms, in the finance teams, um, in, in terms of providing insurance and making sure that their organizations um, large or small are, re are applying the reporting requirements properly, that they're um, checking that the rules are followed and go goals are achieved, achieved. And in terms of the governance that my fellow panelists have also pointed out, um, you know, we don't need to reinvent um, the, the, the frameworks. We need to understand their purpose more and make sure that we, again, are applying them more for the, the right reasons and making sure that that's communicated across the firms and, and, and also across our value chains as well. Um, we haven't really mentioned so much about, um, we've mentioned due diligence, but you know, third party risks and, and where we will be um, uh, impacted by climate change in terms of the, through supply chains and, and other third party relationships. Um, in terms of standards, it's um, good from my seat at ACCA to note that we're really looking um, for more consistent and compar comparable reporting to inform the allocation of capital around the world. And, and you know, greenwashing is part of that. Um, but, you know, I think um, the, the reporting landscape, the, the standards landscape is changing and um, fast, and it's really difficult for companies to, to know what to do. Um, so, I think it's also important with everything that comes out next next month to understand, you know, where our roles are in, in that collective action. So, you know, if we're going to build a greener and fairer world, we all have a, a part to play, um, whether we're from the investment side, which we have loads of members um, in the EU, um, and, you know, also the commitment from other types of statutory um, uh, regulators and and um, the the um, member states themselves to work together to 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 build um, stronger assurance frameworks, and then of course the audit firms to invest 
um, in the cap their capabilities to de deliver, um, you know, truly independent assurance um, and quality um, audits. Um, on the investor side too, I think it's, it's important, as Susanna mentioned, you know, of course, greater transparency is always um, what we want to see, but there, there needs to be the, the stewardship role too that they have um, in terms of working with their investee companies more and guiding them um, to understand what the new rules are and and what they mean to their um to their organization and, and their um, changing stakeholder needs thanks thanks rachel uh, let, let me also ask you do you see this kind of stewardship uh, approach uh, from investors to investee companies because then we also come to the question of due diligence because the investor has to have the knowledge about how the comp invest investee companies is managing their due diligence. So is this happening? I see from our members on the um, investment side, and, and we have quite an array from the vanguards and the Black Rocks to you know, private equity to um, you know, listed country focused type funds. Um, and trust. So um, I do see that. I think investors um, in general have been really um, sort of championing this, particularly for in the to the um, oil and gas and other kind of more obvious sectors um, impacted by climate. And I think that um, on the peripheral, there's things like all of the funds that are signed signatories to the PRI, they have been um, subject to new rules too that require them to not only report on what their criteria is and and how um, the companies are meeting that and in, in that, that kind of journey. But now as of last June, I think it is, you know, just earlier this year, they all also are required now to, to actually report like on that progress and what they're doing as in that stewardship role to, to guide them. And then what do they do if they're not meeting it? Do they, do they still invest? Do they sell? And, and I think that's really interesting to hear the investor's story in that respect. Um, you also see like the Avivas and the, the other, you know, main sort of traditional asset managers. If you really do go look on their website, if you are a conscious investor, um, you can, some of them are reporting very clearly what is in their, their funds um, and how their criteria works in terms of the stock picking and selection. Um, of course, that's on the equity. We could go on about the, um, the you know, development of the um, green bond um, marketplace as well, which is really important and, and growing um, fast. But yes, I do, to answer your question, Haiti, I think um, I, I would think on the investment side, believe me, there are ones who aren't and anyone can set up an ESG fund if they want. Um, but I think that um, the true responsible investors really are um, championing this. Yeah, thanks. This is really exciting. And I, I come to think of what Thomas Friedman wrote in New York Times when, when this ExxonMobil thing happened, where Engine One became an activist uh, investor and uh, changed uh, at least two members of the board, one I know personally, not a Finn. <laughs> but um, anyway, John, do you see a need to, to address uh, directors' duties through European legislation? And uh, is, is remuneration already working for sustainability, or does it need some? Does it need to be triggered? Yeah, the, the, it, it's not easy. I, it, I, I am. Um, I've been working in the financial industry uh, for a long time, and and I don't know exactly when, but I, I guess some some ten years ago. Uh, the, the rules changed for remuneration in which uh, uh, variable pay had to be uh, postponed for uh, split up and postponed uh, uh, re, uh, to, to other later years. And also we, we got that system of clawback if, if, uh, if somebody did something wrong, we could take, uh, do a clawback. But, but for sustainability, the, the, the horizon is of course much longer. Uh, so if you even defer the bonuses with, with three or four or five years, is then the, the long-term uh, value creation in ESG uh, sense already visible. Uh, that, that's a little bit what is, what is puzzling me, but, but in general, what I saw in the financial industry is that at least the focus of, 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 of senior management is, is longer when remuneration uh, systems are longer as well. That, that, that was very clear. Yeah. 
thanks thanks a lot uh, so but you're not saying that the bonus the long term bonus should be the 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 time spin should be 20 years or something yeah, you you can do that, but then of course people will well, yes of they, course they didn't die but they they well, probably half of them retire yeah. and then you of it, course it's really difficult but I guess. yeah perhaps it could be measured in, in in as steps in a sort of a roadmap or something you know progress visible progress measurable progress but okay so um um i am very tempted to go back to uh, the question that was uh, raised by elizabeth gambert about uh, the um supply chain and the challenges in mapping the, the, the supply chain. And um, perhaps for the first time, I, I believe it's the first time during this debate that I will sort of uh, reveal my own position. But in the European Parliament, we really have considered that the new legislation on due diligence has to contain the whole value chain in its entirety. And um, I understood from Elizabeth that this is not easy. Um, and there will be many who will be fighting against such an approach and, and maybe just limit this to tier one, tier two. But nevertheless, I would claim that, um, that many of the issues in the supply and value chain are the, at the very, very sort of root of it. Just think about chocolate production. It's really the cocoa field, which is the, you know, that's where it happens, child labor and deforestation. So Elizabeth, um, can, you, can you explain a little more about how you would, um, how would you manage to, to, to map the supply chain if uh, this kind of uh, obligation would be uh, coming from the EU legislation so that it would not just be tier one, tier two, but the whole of the value chain? Are there some, some uh, help to instruments that can be used? I think there are, there are a few things really to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, one single company cannot solve all the problems that are existing on uh, global supply chains. And, and I explained that it's practically impossible to deal with all the suppliers uh, because there are several hundred thousands up to millions. So you cannot control them all, it's, it's impossible. And so I think we need to understand that um, there is a responsibility of companies, of states, of international organizations, NGOs, we all have to work together. So I think the multi-stakeholder uh, approach is really essential. Without that, we will not be able to tackle the problems. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the examples I gave you that, that sometimes even our French large multinational companies are facing um, suppliers who are bigger than them or who are imposed by states, they just don't care about what, they, what we ask them. You have to imagine that even the large multinationals are facing situations where they don't have leverage alone. So we need to be together, stronger together. And I think that's the, the spirit of the soft law, uh, of the UN guiding principles, of the OECD guiding principles. And the difficulty is to translate this into hard law. And, and that's what what we have experienced in France, the, the, the ambition to, to put the soft law into the hard law, that's where it starts to be tricky because then companies fear what happens if they don't succeed, what happens when down the supply chain, the, the, the suppliers or subcontractors or you know tier two, three, four, five don't do what, what we want them to do, uh, who is responsible? And I think that's the, you know, it, it gets down to this, question when it boils down to responsibility and clearly we we do not agree to uh, be held responsible for damages that occur down the supply chains where we do not have the power to to influence so this is the the, the tricky part and I, I do not want to say that we don't have a part to play because this is obviously something we have to do and this, this is the objective of multi-stakeholder initiatives and there's the ILO uh, which does really a terrific job with uh, you know putting in place initiatives to tackle child labor and forced labor and if the states and the companies and sectors and NGOs and um, also uh, civil society they sit around the table and they say we, we won't you know accept certain practices then things 
may change. But if you say you companies, you have to deal with these problems alone. And if you can't, well, then you pay for the damages. That's that's not a solution we can accept. Yeah, th thank you. Um, by the way, I think it's important that you talk about this multi-stakeholder approach, because uh, I think many realize that um, even the best company cannot manage the production uh, environment in, in, in a country which perhaps doesn't have a sufficient governance and, and, and legislation. But uh, Lena wants to take the floor and maybe one of you from the sort of uh, auditing side, the accounting side could also say something about uh, other tools and instruments to help companies to, to, to map uh, their value chain. So I give the floor to Lena, please. Yes, just a very short, short comment. I, I agree fully with Elizabeth and, and to, to say things as they are, China is the largest producer of components and products, and it is up to the political level, European Union, etc., to have an agreement with China that they are on board with this. And this is not going to, we're not going to get much of anywhere if China is not going to be involved with this, uh, uh, have a real political top level involvement, a commitment to this. So, so we can have all kinds of rules and regulations in Europe, but it's not going to have the real content if the international community is, is only within the European Union. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Lena. Uh, anyone uh, on this question of mapping uh, supply chain, value chain? Uh, looks like Rachel could say something. Yeah, please. Yeah, I think, as I mentioned, um, when I spoke earlier, I mean, knowing your stakeholder is is just um, will have a profound effect on how you um, how, how you survive and, and build resilience in, in the world that we're living in. Um, the due diligence that we that we did before the pandemic it is just not um, fit for purpose. And um, we found with members members all the way down the, the value chains and the in supply chains and how they were um, completely paralyzed from the disruption, the lockdown and everything. I think some of the best, most mature risk frameworks didn't realize the lack of visibility they had in the supply chains. They thought that they were doing um, the right mapping. They thought that they knew, you know, what their risk was out and, and they didn't at all. It wasn't aligned with their, their risk governance policies, their frameworks. And they they literally had to rewrite the script for that, um, and, and and you know the, the the world has changed so fast, um, and with you know the the velocity of the of the disruption, the velocity of transferring information and and understanding it and processing it has has completely um, changed the way they look at it. And like um, the panelists have mentioned, just like with the chip shortage, we had the Suez Canal. Um, it is it, like Elizabeth said. It's almost impossible to predict these types of um, disruptions now, but it's being prepared in terms of consequences and and you know looking at your KPIs in a different way. Supply chains have been about cost reduction for for so long now, mm -hmm. and and you know that's not the name of the game anymore. And um, and you know just again like I mentioned earlier creating these, this, these certain types of targets and values and really aligning that with your strategy, um, not putting risk in a bucket or um, you know, your third party risk over there and supply chain one person there and even one person for su sustainability. It, ha it has to all be aligned. And I think that was one of the, the um, biggest lessons learned from a risk governance point of view. And also I will say on the, we have members at all sizes of companies and you know, we're, we're hearing so much about the, the companies that are struggling in these in these value chains, but there have been some really profound stories like Tesco in the UK and the supply chain um, financing, um, sustainability financing program that they've implemented earlier this year. It's really working. It's paying off for them. It's paying off for their stakeholders. It's paying off for their small um, suppliers in the local markets. You know, Tesco isn't just in the UK. Um, it's a really an interesting story. Same with, with Lush. Um, again, a UK company, but they're all over the world um, trying to source, uh, you know, sustainable materials. And they, they, they had no choice but to, to have to, um, and, you know, this is all in our, our report on ACCA's uh, Professional Insights um, website about their, their story. I urge you to, to look them up because, um, 
you know, it's so holistic and they had no choice but to help their suppliers. And that investment is, is again, paying off. Um, and it's helping those communities as well cope with all of the, um, the crisis from a health and economic point of view. And maybe, maybe uh, thank you. Can I just yes, John, John, yes. I would like to invite John and Susanna oh. to say something for one minute because I don't want yeah, to yeah. see that. I just want to, to, to say that I think it's, it's important that, that, that every company changes its, its vendor management yeah, to put, put conditions in for that yeah, that are stronger than now and yeah, maybe less focusing on price. And then if, if the supplier is important enough, yeah, we, we could even think about third, third party assurance. Uh, uh, statements that they get from their auditor uh, to, 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 to at least know where they are in the ESG journey and to see whether, whether that suits the company that is, that is uh, being supplied. Thanks, John. And Susanna will take the last uh, uh, opportunity to, to express Thanks. herself. Thanks, Heidi. Just very quickly, I want to highlight um, that from results that we've seen from the Corporate Human Rights uh, Benchmark, and this show that uh, a majority out of 225 allegations that were kind of made and assessed on forced labor, health and safety, and child labor, these were against companies that were headquartered in OECD member countries, but it was the opposite when it came to kind of assessing the location of the impact. Uh, and in that uh, regard, it was 85% of these cases were occurring in developing countries. So due diligence is built on proportionality, the right conduct depends on the severity of the impact and the company's involvement with the impact and its own ability to address it. So it is connected to business risk, risk management, but it starts with an understanding of the risks to people and to the environment. Hi, thank you, Susanna. I think it was a great end to our, our exchange. Uh, so thank you very much, Lena, John, Elizabeth, Susanna and Rachel. And I feel that I'm, a, I'm probably a little bit better lawmaker having heard all of you. So I will hand over to uh, the, the um, moderators of uh, the next panel. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you to all the panelists. Thanks. Uh, thank you. So we are now moving to our second panel. The topic is corporate governance as a tool to foster competition and innovation. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Andrew Hobbs. Andrew, I ask you to take over. Please go ahead. Thanks very much, Irena. What a fascinating panel we just had. I was, I was transfixed. Um, uh, it's me again, everyone. Uh, our original moderator uh, had to withdraw at short notice, so I've stepped into the breach, um, but uh, I hope you bear with me. Um, so uh, welcome to this panel on uh, corporate governance as a tool to foster competition and innovation. Uh, to join me to discuss this really important topic, and this is really about uh, looking forward, um, not so much concentrating on on policy initiatives that say the European Union already has, but but just thinking about this topic uh, in light of potential future initiatives, perhaps. And to join me to, to discuss that, we have a great panel for you. And I'll go from uh, left to right, as I can see it on the screen. So we first have Philippe Lombrecht, who is the chair of Business Europe's legal committee. Um, he's a lawyer that, who focuses on financial law, company law, and corporate governance. Um, I will leave you to read his CV uh, online uh, for more details. We then have Christoph van der Elst, uh, who is professor of business law and economics at Tilburg University in the Netherlands and Ghent University in Belgium. He's also an independent director and audit committee of uh, two companies. Um, so can Speak from that perspective uh, as well. Um, to his right, we are joined by someone I'm sure is very well known to, to many of you in this audience, Anne Helen Monsalato, who is a seasoned um, uh, independent director and audit committee chair, and also uh, contributes really to the development of corporate governance um, policy and thinking and good practice. Um, really puts puts um, something back into the system, and we're looking forward to her remarks. And then, last but no, uh, by no means least, um, Evan Epstein, who is an academic from the US. Um, he's executive director and adjunct professor uh, um, at the Center for Business and Law at the University of California at Hastings College of Law. And Evan's going to be talking about um, Silicon Valley, which I mean, talk about uh, uh, a, a, the center of innovation uh, and how corporate governance is, is done there. So um, let me kick off. We're going to follow a similar format to the previous panel. Uh, please, audience, do put questions in the Q&A and I'll get 
to them probably later on in the um, in in the panel um, towards the end. Um, but we're going to ask for some opening remarks from each of the panel members, and I'm going to do that by asking a few questions so that we'll come at it from a particular angle rather than asking for their general thoughts on, on innovation. So let me start with Philippe first. Um, just thinking about the sort of delineation between the role of management and boards, um, you know, have you observed, sort of observed new practices as far as the board is concerned on how they're addressing the whole topic of strategy? So looking forward, you know, the, the concept is that the boards are often um, seems backward looking, you know, dealing with compliance, um, oversight of management, performance evaluation, that sort of thing. But in terms of the strategic forward looking um, conversation, the need to innovate, the need to be competitive. Um, where do you see the, the, the kind of difference between the role of boards and management in that, in that topic? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, I think that the, the main question is, what is the role of a board? And uh, we already have discussions from one kind of corporate governance model to another one. If you're one tier board or two tier board, you have already different systems. So the, the first question you should ask yourself is, what kind of system are the more incentive in order for the board to be able to really think about strategy? And the next question you should ask yourself is, what is it necessary for a good board to be able to think in a sustainable way and in a long-term view about an adequate strategy for the company? Now, if we agree with this, we have to consider that certainly in Europe, there is no one answer to this. You have good practices, but you have very different systems. You have company law with one board systems. You have company law with two tier board systems. You have Germany with the Mitbestimmung. You have many, many, many different approaches to the question you are asking me. And if tomorrow, uh, the most important thing for the strategy of the board is to look in the long-term value creation, the sustainable value creation. In other words, if it is to pay attention to the impact of the firm on the global value chain or on the global production of what you're doing, then definitely it is time to give enough time to the board to reflect on this. And then we have to question ourselves on the existing obligations of the different uh, EU regulation system, directives, et cetera, et cetera, and ask ourselves if that put us in a competitive situation towards non-EU companies. Because it's very nice to be extremely good on regulation, but the question is, are we going to be able to make sure that we're not the only one to follow good practices and to be the only ones to be sustainable? Because this is not going to be enough. We need a global action from most countries in order to um, make the transition we are all thinking about. So to summarize my point and not to be too long, I do believe that for boards to be able to think in an efficient way about strategy and long-term and sustainable strategy, they need to have sufficient room to innovate. They need to have sufficient room to be creative. And we should start thinking about a little bit less paper uh, reporting and filling uh, the board's reporting a little bit more about creativity, new solutions, possibility to change your value chain, possibility to look at your whole value chain in a more efficient way. And so I'm asking, and that will be the end of my first introduction, what is best, a system that will make sure that companies want to do this, or a system that mistrust companies and do consider that they're not able to know what is good for their strategy. 
it's really nearly a philosophical question, I do believe. It's a great way to think of it. Do companies need a carrot or a stick? I think that's what you're saying. <laughs> Very good. So thank you. Thanks for that, for the opening remarks. We'll come back to you. I'll pick up on a few points, and I'm sure the other panelists will, will want to come back as well. But um, Christoph, um, we heard, I, I don't know if you were, um, you saw the fireside chat, but um, uh, I think it was uh, Roger that mentioned the that uh, private equity model was a, was an interesting model to look in terms of the proximity of, of ownership, which was something that Goran talked about um, to you know and its effect on good governance. That it, the, the argument was that highly engaged um, owners are often lead to, to to kind of long term focused companies. Um, what's your experience for, for in terms of sort of private equity boards and, and their focus on strategy and, and, and kind of competitiveness, innovation, et cetera. What can we learn from them at the public company level? Thanks, Andrew. Well, directors of boards of private equity firms are, are often directors that are very well informed, have this typical hands-on approach and are seen also to be more interventionists than independent directors, in particular in public company boards. Now, this is because, in fact, that these private equity board members rarely rely solely on the board meetings. They go beyond it. They uh, continuously review detailed information flows that are provided, but especially, and that is an issue that I will further develop in a minute, um, the, the earnings reports and the development also for the financial results of uh, the companies in which they invest. Now, so they, they daily often engage in conversations with, with management. Now, these private equity boards often also operate in a time horizon that is certainly stretching beyond the quarterly or the semi-annually uh, earnings reports that uh, many listed companies have to comply with and that are, of course, of importance given the market pressure that is experienced by the boards of directors of listed companies. So they truly committed directors whilst other interests have to be taken into account for these directors that are directors in listed companies. So often also these directors have engaged uh, from a wealth perspective. So the director's wealth also, these directors is at risk in a number of these private equity boards. So they act also a little bit, maybe a little bit more as proprietors and act as proprietors than other ones. At the same time, some of these elements you find for these private equity board members, you can also find, for instance, in family board members. They also quite often have a number of similar expertises and similar ways of behaving vis-a-vis -vis even the listed companies. So what is, of course, there is something to learn from that. But what is also of importance is that we have to take into account that for that there is a major difference between these private equity boards on the one hand side and the, the directors that are forming a board of listed companies. In particularly, the framework of these listed companies is significantly different. We've heard it constantly already of the previous um, participants, uh, like, like Philip mentioned it also, there are so many differences between these different types of companies that are also listed on um, at, at the uh, stock exchanges. So the overall institution institutional setup largely differs, uh, which, for instance, think about the involvement of employees in many companies uh, throughout the listed entities in different countries. We've heard about Sweden, where this is the case. We definitely have to take into account, for instance, Germany, where this is the case. And also now, which is more emphasized for the listed companies, this system of stakeholder capitalism that was mentioned in the first debate, which is less of an issue, I believe, also for these private equity board members. So the current state of the art is in particularly for boards that they, and especially listed companies, they, the list of requirements is that is, is virtually endlessly. So next to the strategic demands that there are and which are currently also increasing and is not a homogeneous list of strategic issues that has to be taken up by the boards of directors of these listed companies, quite often different from these two private equity boards. Think about, for instance, the recent case of Shell, where different interest groups strive for different strategic choices the board has to make. Most recently, one of these hedge funds is saying, split up the whole company. Whilst in other ones are saying, we have to have a faster transition to um, carbon neutral developments, stop the oil. All these differences have to be taken on board by these boards of directors. 
So to wrap up also a little bit from the European perspective, what can be done, I think that it is very important there that we that at European level, the development goes along the lines of engagement with in particularly taking into account the specific interests at the level of the listed companies for a selection process that is adequate for that particular company and that there are appropriate onboarding programs and executive remuneration policies, which I'll talk of, uh, but we can already find in SRD2, that in particularly are emphasized through, I would say, nudging uh, from the strategic frameworks provided by the um, European legislator that can be helpful to take into account as much as possible the strategic issues that more easily can be taken on board by these private equity boards than solely by these company board members of listed entities that have to take up more responsibilities in that respect. I hope it's a good starter. <laughs> yes, thank you, Chris. A lot in there. Maybe I can just ask a quick clarification. Uh, fine question before I move on to Evan. You talked about sort of stakeholder capitalism, which was a point that has been raised by some of our previous speakers, and you said it wasn't such an issue for private equity. I wasn't clear whether that meant that they, they do deal with it easily or they can ignore it. Could no, no, they definitely that? can't ignore it anymore. Absolutely not. I just wanted to make sure, make sure, because that's the sort of PE that I remember of, of sort of 10, 15 years ago. But um, but yeah, no, I thought that's what you, what you meant. Yeah, yeah, I just indeed. wanted to, to clarify. Uh, but, Certainly also, but still, well, of course, since 10 years ago, where this is really also the issue that they didn't have to take care of it, they now absolutely also have to take care of it. Uh, but still, if you compare it with the current standards that have you, you have to cope with enlisted companies in the oil, in the, in the uh, extraction business and so on, that goes well beyond quite often the combination of strategic returns in light of, and of course, taking into account sustainability, which is taking almost the lead for a number of listed companies. So there seems to be still a little bit of a difference that the average PE can take it into account compared to what the boards of listed companies must by now mandatorily take into account. Got it, very helpful. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, let's let's move from from Europe to, I, I don't know if you are actually in the Bay, um, Evan, but um, to, to the US. <laughs> Um, and let's hear about the Silicon Valley experience. You know, as, as I said earlier on, you know, it's, if we think about innovation, that might be a, a word association game and you think of Silicon Valley. But um, uh, yeah, how, how do uh, the Silicon Valley companies do governance for innovation and com competition? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I am in San Francisco. It's not the real Golden Gate behind <laughs> me, but uh, it's not far away. So. Uh, yeah, obviously Silicon Valley is a very uh, innovative uh, region, and you know, from a corporate governance perspective, the way I think about it, there's a lot of difference between startups, between companies, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs that are around here, uh, and public companies. Right? It's a little bit what Christoph was saying. You know, you got to make a distinction among what kind of organization we're talking about. But I'd say that. Uh, everything here in Silicon Valley is booming. I mean, the numbers are incredible. You look at venture capital, uh, we, the first half of this year, uh, there were 7,000 companies raising about $150 billion on track to raise $300 billion. That's almost double last year. Uh, you have the number of IPOs are record settings, right? We have uh, you know, 250 operating companies that went public. Uh, a lot of Silicon Valley companies are going public. For a long time, there was a mantra here to, A, let's stay private for longer because we don't have to deal with going public. There's so much capital flowing into the system, not only from venture capital, but you have sovereign wealth funds, you have mutual funds, you have private equity funds, you have hedge funds. Everyone's saying, hey, the value is being created at the private level. We want to be part of that. So uh, a lot of people were going in the private markets. Uh, valuations are going up. We all know about unicorns. There are about 900 unicorns globally, uh, $3 trillion in value. But you know what was interesting with COVID-19 is that the markets, the public markets came back. And so a lot of companies are going public. Uh, and, and the valuations, which was the craziest thing to me, is that a lot of people were saying that all these private companies were overvalued, that these valuations were crazy, that the VCs were playing the Ponzi scheme. 
But then they go public and the valuations are double, triple, four times what they were in the private markets. So that is an incredible uh, trend and, and uh, has a lot of particularly finance professors uh, scratching their heads and saying, what's going on here? Uh, and then, uh, you know, in, if, you, if you add the new development of SPACs, that's another way that made it easier for companies to go public. I mean, the, the numbers, again, 530 SPACs this year raising $130 billion. So uh, it's very dynamic. Uh, I would say that uh, boards in private startup companies, uh, governance is very, uh, is very lean in the sense that uh, a typical startup is one or two founders plus one or two venture investors and maybe an independent director. So if you think of the distinction among public companies and private companies, essentially it's flipped over in terms of composition. There are no independent directors or very few. Now, as the startup goes public, because of the public requirements of having a majority of uh, independent directors, then you start adding uh, uh, independent directors into it. So that's the first big distinction. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of questions in Silicon Valley on diversity and uh, problems on diversity are, are real. Uh, certainly, if you think that in venture capital, uh, many of the partners are not diverse or the entrepreneurs are not diverse, who's going to populate these boards? So at least in the public markets, you have the ability to nominate independent directors that gives you a valve to be more in, more independent and uh, sorry, more diverse. And, and that's been a big trend here in Silicon Valley in the sense that California is the first state in the United States to propose quotas, uh, a gender uh, with SBA 26 two years ago, and uh, minorities with a new law last year, AB 979, which mandates, you know, minorities on boards. And then NASDAQ at a national level said, you know, if you want to go public, you also have to have uh, gender and minorities on your board, and that's phased out. So I think it's it's a really interesting trend of, of what's going on. There's obviously been a lot of media around frauds, right? And we read about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. We read about Adam Newman and WeWork. Uh, there is a lot of that too, right? Um, uh, you know, there's so much capital in the market that entrepreneurs are trying to push. And, and you know, there was an interesting article in New York Times last week about due diligence, right? Are investors really looking into the companies and you know, what's the level of fraud going on? I think the power dynamic used to be last decade in the venture capital hands. They could call the shots if a CEO wasn't doing his job, they could fire him. But that changed after Google's IPO in 2004. Uh, founders have more control, have more power, dual cost shares. Therefore they're saying, hey, if you wanna invest in my company, it's my rules, right? So we are seeing excesses both from the founder level and, you know, there are still, you know, VCs that, you know, are trying to extract value. So that's interesting from the governance perspective. And how are these boards of startups populated in the sense that our common shareholders have some level of control? Do founders have some level of control? So there are many, many moving parts. And, you know, I can go on and on, uh, you know, crypto, uh, hello, $3 trillion uh, in the market, Bitcoin and Ethereum all time high. There's a lot of development on decentralized autonomous organizations. You know, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg goes out and says, hey, the new company is called Meta. So there's a lot of metaverse talk. Uh, that's a big trend. Uh, you know, I think you have to look behind uh, the scene, right? Like, uh, you know, people kind of hate on Facebook, but hey, there is a vision out there and he's got a futuristic vision and you got to listen to this because there's a reason why you would flip a $1 trillion company into the future and people uh, don't have to sleep on this. So I think there's a lot of dyna you know, dynamic uh, feelings. The one thing that people are toying against Silicon Valley is taxes and other issues and kind of Austin and Miami are, are getting a bigger play than Silicon Valley and whether California's politics are too uh, progressive and losing its edge, right? Silicon Valley used to be by far the biggest tech center and now some people are saying, well, you know, Elon Musk left to Texas and other companies are thinking about it. So there is a question about whether San Francisco has lost some sort of edge uh, to other parts of the country. And, and that's all part of that. So I'll stop here, but happy to take any questions that you want. Thank you very much. Um... We'll come to questions in a second. I mean, I, so what I was hearing, I think, there from you was that, I mean, advantages and disadvantages to being an innovative company 
um, from being either public or private, but not necessarily coming down uh, either either way, um, and that there's still room for innovative companies with either model. Um, mm -hmm. And Helen, um, we're going to ask you about audit committees. Um, I, I made it sort of my introductory remarks. I talked to the sort of the concept of the board being, you know, traditionally one of of compliance and oversight and and that kind of thing, with little time or not enough time left over to strategic thinking. Um, if, if I could think of any audit, any committee of the board that was perhaps could be more accused of that, it would probably be the audit committee. Um, but we know it focuses on risk and forward looking as well. But what's the role of the audit committee, in your view, in, in supporting the board with a strategic and innovative outlook? Thank you, um, Andrew. This is a, a very good question. So uh, uh, audit committees have been growing uh, in importance uh, as the role of the board is growing in importance. And uh, alongside other committees like remuneration committees or the ASG committee, uh, audit committees have a, a very important role to play. Um, at the minimum, audit committees are tasked with taking care of the reliability of the reporting as was pointing during uh, the, first, uh, the first panels. And currently we're speaking about financial information and tomorrow we'll be speaking about non-financial information as well. So taking care of the reliability of information means overseeing first how it is prepared, how risks over the preparation of that information are considered and mitigated, and has it been audited by an independent audit firm with a good quality audit. So obviously the role is important because Reporting, whether it be on financial or non-financial information, is reporting on the execution of the strategy. And the, boards, uh, the board wants to make sure that sufficient effort is dedicated to robust and reliable reporting. And again, uh, I think that now on we can speak about financial and non-financial. So in the end, as was uh, pointed by uh, Philippe, I believe, um, uh, the full board um, is responsible for the strategy definition and oversight, but the audit committee is really this group of people who will be able to say uh, that the information that we are looking at as a board and that you're providing to external users and on which investments decisions are made and performance is assessed uh, is reliable and performance, again, uh, financial and, and non-financials. So really the reporting informs strategy um, iterations. Um, as you uh, rightly pointed out, uh, unfortunately, to a certain extent, the audit committee is sometimes seen as mostly a backward looking committee or a compliance committee, but I would like to mention some areas where when we think of it, it is mostly, I would say, uh, non-compliance and, and forward-looking. For example, and I will mention a few, a few of these areas, is the information included in the reporting sufficient for stakeholders' needs? Um, how is this information rendered dynamic with sensitivity analysis? Do they take non-financial impact into account? For example, when we have a, a certain amount of, of fuel um, uh, operating expenditures, uh, how the speed for transportation company will translate into higher uh, fuel expenditures and higher uh, increased emissions, for example. Uh, what about building the full architecture on non-financial information reporting in a way that ensures it is um, embedded in, in, in the daily operations, but also leveraged in the daily uh, decision making, and all that is forward looking. Um, another area, how is the articulation made? between the financial reporting and execution of the ESG strategy. How are the impacts measured? Currently, we, we uh, speak a lot about measures uh, taken. We do not speak really about impacts. How do we report on our ESG commitments? Uh, again, how do we follow up uh, over, on those over time? Um, another area, if the, if the accounting and finance organization within the company well organized, so that they have the additional bandwidth to manage regular reporting, but also the strategic operations that will accompany transition and the related non-financial reporting. Uh, and all this, again, uh, is part of the discussion that the, the audit committee has uh, with, with management. Um, another example, how is trust built with the finance community to attract sufficient financing for capital expenditures in innovation and in the transition? As somebody uh, rightly pointed out, uh, the, the, the transition will need uh, financing. It will be costly. Uh, so 
to attract that financing, you need to have a, a, a good story. Uh, and that story will be based on robust and reliable uh, reporting. Uh, another point, how do internal control systems and fraud deterrence programs are updated to include risks regarding to SD reporting and in particular, I would say, and that's for the full board, the risk that the company does not work the talk. So uh, in, in, as, as a key point, I would say, uh, the audit committee should be uh, very careful to not perform in a silo. As I said, uh, the role of the board is growing, the role of the audit committee is growing, but it's, it's part, uh, it's a committee of the board, and the audit committee also needs to connect with other committees. And they also need to more extensively leverage support functions uh, such as risk management, internal control, and internal audit. And all this was brilliantly covered by John in, in panel one, so I will not, uh, not expand here. Thank you, Anne Helene, some fantastic examples. I was very struck by one of the comments you made, which I think I would have, if I thought about it long enough, I would have got there. But I, I, I was conscious of the comments that Evan made about the high valuations of some of the companies in California and the importance of the information being robust, as you said. And I, I thought of the, the example of Oatly a few months ago, where their, their share price was heavily affected by by. Um, what they said about their water use, which was really interesting. So the, the share price dropped when, when an activist investor challenged them about that. It's just one example of, of, of kind of how those two, two points link. Um, happy for you to guys to comment um, comment on each other's remarks. I want to ask a question in a second, but there's, there's one question coming in from um, the audience. Oh, I think it was maybe from Christoph actually, um, was um, in, you mentioned SPACs. Um, and you were talking about um, that, I don't know if you use these words, but maybe questionable governance practices or, or ones that weren't aligned to public company best practice, maybe I could put it that way. But how do, how do you think companies can uh, that want to go public can adjust their business models, their governance arrangements um, to, uh, to kind of build the trust that they need to, to float and, and stay on, on public markets? I think that's a question for Evan. Is that for me? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, SPACs has been a, a huge uh, change. You know, if you think of, of trends, one of the things that I notice is that the, the distinction among private companies and public companies, certainly among the private sphere of early stage, mid stage, late stage, is getting all blurry, right? And so uh, SPACs, basically what they've done is, is create a third avenue of going public. It used to be that a venture capital firm would only uh, you know, take a company public through an IPO or through a merger. But now we have this SPAC alternative. There is also a direct listing alternative. So there are really four ways of liquidity of going public. So uh, what's interesting about SPACs is they've existed for a long time. Right, it's, they've been around since the early 1990s. Uh, but for the last two years, uh, people have found a way to really push capital into this vehicle. And the problem that we are seeing is that what are the incentive of the sponsors? These are the people who arrange the spec. So basically there are some people who raise a vehicle, let's say they raise $200 million in an IPO, just a blank slate company. And they say, our purpose is just to acquire a private company, right? So they go out there and they've got two years to find a company, they merge and that company essentially is a public company, right? And so uh, the question is, well, the SEC has kind of looked into, well, how are you getting paid? What are the fees that you're charging? And there they've seen excesses, right? So essentially uh, you would bring, those sponsors would go into the board, right? So uh, some people say, well, are they the right people to be on the board? And, and some specs have, but we've also seen some celebrities, right? There are, you know, football players and there are like Hollywood uh, stars and, and, and there's a lot of frothiness at that level. On the, on the other hand, uh, you know, there's a big question in, there are so many specs that are formed. Only this year are 530 specs, right? That means that there are have to find 530 private companies and valuations that are over a billion dollars. The odds of that happening, as you can imagine, are not that good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they have two years to do these mergers. And if you don't do the merger, you give the money back to the investors. So the problem is 
how many mergers are going to be real? And, and, and there is a big question mark whether a lot of these specs that went public are going to survive, right? Are, are just too frothy. And, and there, in any other period, there should not be a public company. And so from a governance perspective, I, I think there are many risks. There are also risks in litigation. You know, some people, some shareholders here, plaintiff litigators in the US are saying, well, what are the disclosures that you're giving? And because of the spec nature, uh, you can give a forecast of five years where in an IPO, you cannot. And, and, and now uh, plaintiff litigators are trying to, to find the faults, not only on the SPAC side, but on the D-SPAC. The D-SPAC is when you actually find a target company and you do the merger. And then it becomes like a merger. And I, I think that's going to be a big area in the next two years of whether this capital is going to be well deployed, well deployed or not. And then remember, there are a number of hedge funds that are very uh, smart in investing in these SPACs because it's free money for them, right? They park the money in, in the SPAC, and if they don't find a, a target, they get the money back plus interest. So it's great for what some of these hedge funds to invest this way because they only have upside. And it's not necessarily true that the investors, the shareholders that eventually buy into the SPAC will benefit too because they will get diluted once the company goes uh, public uh, and the demerger goes public. So it's very interesting from a governance perspective what's going on. Uh, but, but in theory, right, you, you have dynamics that are market driven and the fiduciary duties uh, are, are much higher. One last point I will say, the DNO, the, the direct insurance, uh, uh, insurance uh, for, for these SPACs are incredibly high because the insurers realize that the risk is, is much bigger. And so you are taking these fees, these premiums that are incredibly high. DNO in general in the United States has gone off the roof, right? Uh, for public companies and now for these SPAC companies, it's almost double. Certainly if you want a SPAC of a foreign company. So what could happen is you go and SPAC in the United States and they find a European company yeah. to go public. And, and the insurance for that is even higher, right? So these are all, uh, really interesting trends that we're looking at. And I know there are several European companies that have gone public in the US through SPACs, uh, vehicles and battery space and other spaces. And, and that's something that people are looking at as well, because if they don't find the companies in the US, you can certainly find the companies in, in Europe or Latin America, Asia. Thanks so much, Evan. Uh, Philip, you want to come in here, looks like. Yes, thank you. J just a short remark on the SPACs. It seems to me that's really typical of the American market to be very efficient in finding new ways to bring companies to the market. And if I'm looking at it from a more uh, careful perspective, maybe a more European perspective, I can't help but ask myself what you are promising to your shareholders. You tell them, well, wait two years until I know what I'm going to give you. That's basically the idea of the SPACs. And there, I really ask myself, what are we speaking about? We are speaking about here in Europe, about a, a EU long-term framework to create sustainable companies. And we look at the United States and we find a very short-term system where nobody knows exactly what will happen after those two years, because you have sponsors. So you, you just trust people, basically, that's it. And then really, it's, it is incredibly interesting to see the difference between the way you guys in San Francisco are looking at creating new business, and we, more conservative, I would say, uh, in continental Europe, we are kind of extremely cautious and once again, you see the reflection too in the, in the way we finance our company and in the approach we have to all this. So my, my point in this dialogue is we, we, we probably need some more capacity to get enough money to fast growing companies in Europe but is it at the price of going so far as putting money in kind of a black box where nobody knows exactly what's coming on or 
With other words, is it because money is so cheap today that SPACs are such a success? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if I get the, the chance to reply to that, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, the interest rates are so low. Uh, stimulus in the United States uh, from the government is, is, is big. People are looking for yield. And, and this is a great vehicle to do it. And they don't know where to park their money and equity market. That's why we're seeing an explosion. But you made a very interesting point. The distinction among uh, the ecosystem in the US and Europe and how development of companies has changed. And I have to say with my US hat that here we have a very uh, active and flourishing ecosystem of tech companies, whereas in Europe, we are not seeing as much. If you look at unicorns, uh, you know, I feel it's all about US versus China. Europe has some shining lights. And, and the question for European companies is, why are we left behind? What can we do to catch up? And it seems that we are not relevant anymore in the tech ecosystem. And if you look at the big tech companies, they're all American and they're all Chinese. I find fascinating uh, what's going on in China now because in China, uh, essentially the government has, is cutting off the tech companies and saying, hey, you guys don't have the power, it's we as the government. And uh, uh, here in the US, as you know, the founders of the tech companies have a lot of power because of deal cost shares and in some ways are detached from uh, you know, other uh, kind of power structures. Uh, and, and that's really important from a policy perspective. Uh, and, and there is a lot of risk taking. I, I, I can almost, well, I can't guarantee, but I can predict there's gonna be a lot of shenanigans with these facts. We're gonna see a lot of uh, you know, you know, cake and faces of people and it's gonna be bad and investors are gonna lose out. The problem is fraud, right? When you get to the fraud level, and that's where I think you need a very active SEC, you need a very active plaintiff bar, which you know maybe is a distinction between the US and, and, and Europe. There are a lot of short sellers. There are market mechanism, mechani mechanisms to make sure that you don't have fraud, but there are people that are peddling all these companies left, right, and center that are not gonna produce value. And a lot of investors are not gonna have a return, but investors are willing to put this money because it's sitting in the bank and they're losing inflation rate is 5% and, and they need to deploy the money into something. So uh, the challenge again is for European companies to think, well, we should be you know, investing more and doing more and being more relevant in the tech ecosystem and not you know, over-regulating a lot of uh, the activities that seems to be you know, much more, you mentioned careful as Europeans, well, is being careful gonna kill any kind of new development? And that's, and that's a problem. Let me, let me bring, thank you, Evan and Philip. Let me bring in Christoph and, and Anna Lane. Actually, Christoph, I can see you got your hand, hand up. I was, but um, go for it. Okay. Well, thank you. What, what I find interesting is indeed that there seems to be an enormous flow of, of available cash that flows in many directions. And there is, in fact, also then a supply by companies through SPACs and other mechanisms that, in fact, provides then the floor for these investors to step in. It seems to be, at least also Philip probably would, would say the similar thing, I think, is that we are much more cautious. But the consequence of it all is if we look at our markets, it is pretty heavily regulated. And whilst as you see has also so many rules, it still seems that we went beyond in a very specific way. Like, for instance, if we return to the topic of today, the governance issue. We not only have these mandatory requirements in many countries for independent directors and, and diversity and ethical rules and name it. We all have it. Well, the only one, and, and, and maybe we can learn from you from that perspective, the only straightforward rule that I noticed over the last five years popping up indeed in the US is the rule, next to a number of, of, of NASDAQ and, and Nice rules, specific ones, is the one on the gender diversity that popped up in California. So is, is this in any way, in your opinion, even an, an a hindrance or do you see also as an, as an advantage because it is to a certain extent a copy pasting behavior of the european context where we develop it we developed it over the last 15 years it's great to have you quickly quickly so i can bring Anne helen in but yeah yeah i mean i'll just say very quickly i think um i think it's we're not going to go back 
Uh, I think California passed this law. Uh, I think uh, a lot of other states are looking into it. Uh, diversity on boards is something that is going to happen whether you like it or not. Uh, NASDAQ has already gone into the diversity rule approved by the SEC. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Uh, it, it's going to be better. Uh, you know, the, the, that, that the California law is focused on public companies. So any headquartered uh, company in California that trades and, and NASDAQ on your stock exchange is subject to it, but not private companies. So, you know, the it, more interesting question is why didn't it go into the private companies, which, you know, that's a different debate, but it's limited, right? There's only 600 companies in California that are subject to it. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think uh, the ESG framework is, is getting very strong in public companies. It's kind of going down into private markets, but diversity itself, you know, <clears throat> let me say one thing about that. Even though it's very questionable from a constitutional perspective that you can do a distinction on, on, uh, on gender. Uh, and if this law, California law would go to the Supreme Court in the United States, they would probably lose and it would be struck down by the Supreme Court, certainly the conservative Supreme Court that we have. But despite this legal kind of questioning, companies said, you know, we think it's the right thing and they are proposing and they're changing the composition of board. So I think, I think we, we have to, you know, accept that that's kind of the new reality and, and, and companies are fine with it. And I think the market has already taken that into consideration and I don't see much of a hindrance uh, because it just only affects like the public companies and most of the action in Silicon Valley is still in the private market. Thank you. Um, let me let me just ask her to broaden it out. We'll let's come come back to this point about competitiveness of EU versus US and perhaps what to do about it in the EU. So we talked about sort of more funds being available to invest in 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 tech companies, whether it be startups or ones that are growing. Um, we also heard a lot about from the earlier speakers about sort of the the role of regulation, carrot and stick. Um, and uh, Christoph talked about the private equity model and, and what we might learn from that. But if I start with Anne Helene, I mean, what 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 can we do at a policy level about um, competitiveness? Is it is it about removing huge swathes of regulation, or is it about the right regulation? Is it add, adding more? What what is it? And what and what would you pick? Um, what the what, <laughs> for innovation particularly? Yeah, yeah it's a... <laughs> That, that, that's the topic. Um, um, I, I think um, regulators, and, and we can speak about, uh, you know, what it means for the, from an audit committee perspective, but I think, you know, leveling uh, the playing field is, uh, is especially important. And we, we're speaking, for example, of uh, uh, currently a lot of, 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 um, of the EU taxonomy, okay? The problem of the EU taxonomy is that it's focused on solutions. Uh, it's really clearly driven by a willingness to identify solutions. And we now have an emerging issue, which is how to attract the level of financing required to transition uh, for, the, for, the, for the traditional economy. And, and you know, the solutions will, uh, is, it's, it will be a growing part, obviously, uh, in the future. But currently, we have traditional economy, which needs to, 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 to finance uh, the transition. So there should be, in terms of regulation, the equivalent mechanism uh, rewarding banks and other financiers for the financing of that transition by good actors of the traditional um, uh, economy. Also, and here I will uh, probably uh, tickle a little bit Christophe, I would say, uh, I think there is a need to reconsider the balance between uh, reporting by public companies and reporting by private companies. Uh, there has been a trend recently, a um, number of articles in the Financial Times, of bad assets moving to private, which uh, ESG-wise uh, might not be in the best interest of all because they are disappearing from the radars, they are disappearing, exonerated from current ESG reporting and in terms of monitoring uh, for, for, for their financing. So with, with respect to ESG reporting, I think all actors uh, should be concerned. We, we spoke about stakeholders capitalism. You know, if we stakeholders capitalism, it's everybody. So reporting should be done by everybody to, to the rest of the population. Uh, and the status of, uh, of public interest entity should not work as a disadvantage compared to private status regarding the ability to attract uh, financing. And thankfully we had a, a certain number of calls into, into that direction. Um, we, with respect to, um, 
more spe specifically to, 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 um, to regulation in relation to the, to the mission of the audit committee relating to non-financial information, uh, I think that audit regulators need to anticipate the required changes at their level regarding the oversight of ESG auditors, and this will definitely not be simple. First, they will have to address a different type of firms with different cultures. How do they prepare so that ESG auditing standards, including documentation, are practically applicable to a wide range of audit participants with a good overall quality, or is it a forced choice to select big four firms? Second, I would say that the field of ESG is wide, uh, very wide and highly technical in certain areas. So they will need to come up with new competencies to uh, challenge the audit work done in that area during their inspections. And that's basically the same reasoning that we had for uh, internal control over financial reporting uh, at that time. And there is a, a third aspect regarding non-financial information, which is how it will be used and analyzed and here artificial intelligence will probably be of help. And based on current experience, algorithm bias and careful selection of words can influence the outputs. So how will this be taken into consideration by the auditors, by the audit regulators, and by the securities market regulators? How rating agencies will be monitored in that respect, in particular considering a, a very high weight of, of passive investing uh, uh, currently. So these are a few, uh, a few topics of, uh, of where I would like to see uh, regulation uh, uh, moving. Thanks, Anna Len. There's a lot, lot for policymakers to think there. Some good, good points. Um, I don't know who wants to react. Philip, what, what would you do if it was left up to you? Well, th thank you very much. You give me the word. The problem is maybe to ask ourselves if regulation is what we need or active companies <coughs> is what we need. Uh, I'm really asking myself today, what is good? We have in Europe one of the most sophisticated regulatory system in the world, and we see delisting of a lot of companies. Just to give you a few ideas, um, since 2015, we have seen 300% less or fewer initial IPO in Europe. We have today a stock market value of non-financial companies that has fallen by nearly 50% while the dominance of the US and China has grown. So what we witness, and I think that even agrees with me, is that the share of public companies in the world that are European is decreasing extremely fast if you compare that to China, to the United States and to other countries. Of course, you have the weight of GAFAM and all these companies, but nevertheless, it's a reality. And we are trying at the same time in Europe to do something quite extraordinary. It is to transition our economy from a situation that is extremely dangerous for the future to a sustainable economy within 30 years time. Are we using the good uh, tools in order to do that? My question is, is it better to regulate and see that less and less companies are growing? Or is it better to give some more leeway to companies, and that's the carrot and stick we were speaking a little bit earlier, and to create incentives for companies mm -hmm. who are investing in what we think, in what we believe is the future for the transition? And that question, I think, really needs to be debated in a lot more philosophical way and not just put audit systems, again, other audit systems. We need to see what is the ultimate goal of companies, and it's to create sustainable value. It is to create ecosystems that will answer the problems of today in tomorrow's time, you know? So why don't we speak a little bit more about how to reach those companies we want, about how to be those competitive companies we want, about how to have this, fin this financial market in Europe that would be more efficient and not always in terms of more regulation, but, and I'm not against 
regulation. I'm against the overload of useless regulation we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years. Thank you. Very, very, very clear. I mean, I think that's, if I understand it rightly, is what the Sustainable Finance Initiative by the European Commission is designed to do, which is to fund, you know, the cheaper money to, to the most sustainable activities. But um, take your point entirely about um, about understanding whether your regulation has actually the effect that you that you you expect for it, and, and actually analysing that. Um, I don't know who else wants to respond. Evan, have you got? If you were an EU policymaker, what would you do? Well, uh, that's an interesting question, but I, I would I would try to use the the playbook that uh, Silicon Valley has used, which is really push for new investments, uh, kind of liberalize the rules here. Uh, you know, one advantage that the U.S. has over the U.S. and this may be political is that uh, there is a lot more uh, importance given to entrepreneurs and to um, to capital in a sense than labor, right? Uh, there's not so much uh, union protection. Silicon Valley, we don't have many unions here. And that makes it a little bit more dynamic. Uh, although I will say that in, in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of equity, meaning uh, compensation to employees. So people, uh, you know, it, with all these IPOs, the number of employees that have become millionaires is record setting, right? Uh, this you don't see much in Europe and other places, even in New York or other places where, you know, people get paid in, you know, cash or a typical compensation, uh, good benefits. But here you get a slice of the action, right? So about 20, 30 percent of the equity goes to employees. And so the, the, there is an interesting uh, a model that Silicon Valley has developed over the last 50 years. And this creates more investment into the system. Uh, I think another big advantage has been an open immigration system where a lot of the talent is coming to Silicon Valley historically, right? Top Chinese, Indian, European, Latin American, everyone who really wants to do tech comes over here. If you look at the companies in Silicon Valley, 51 or 52% of them have founders that are immigrants. So Europe has to do something to attract talent because at the end of the day, that's really what matters. And so if you attract the talent, if you make it easier for people to start companies in Europe, I mean, Europe is a, is a beautiful place, right? So uh, if you don't overburden them with regulations, uh, I know that, you know, I know France, you know, they, they're, Paris, you know, was starting to do a lot of activity with startups. I know that, uh, you know, the UK and other Germany, I mean, the, the, it's not inexistent, but uh, if you want to be the leading uh, place for uh, you know tech, uh, that's what it takes. And you know China basically and the United States have a, a a big leap in terms of advantage. But Europe needs to catch up. And I do think from the outside it looks to me that it's extremely formal, extremely you know there's a lot of rules both at the national level and the EU, EU level. And that hindrance kind of I feel it's very hard to start a company in Europe and to run it in a way that to, to, to give you capacity to grow. Uh, and that's what Silicon Valley in some way uh, made it easier. Although we have challenges in the United States as well, right? It's not like it's a perfect place, but that's my reaction is, you know, just try to make it easy for companies to start and don't put, don't over-regulate uh, before they can actually flourish. Thank you, that's clear. And then I'll leave the, the last word to Christoph. We've got two minutes to go, so. Um... What would you do, Christoph? Well, thank you. Um, in all honesty, um, finding the appropriate balance. I um, and that is that's a difficult one because in, I, I see that both Philip and Evan is is going into the direction that we really have to consider some kind of deregulation of some of the rules that are to be considered as red tape, in order to stimulate also innovation. On the opposite side, we also feel and we go ahead, we can't stop it, that we still are going to move and probably Anna Helene supports me there, we're going to move to more standardization, more rules and so on with respect to ESG. We also need them. And yeah, on the one hand side, we also I think that we also somehow should be saying that we're not doing bad from that perspective in Europe. I think on that perspective, we take the lead. If I, sorry, if I compare what, what the state of the art is currently in the US and the state of the art is in China, we're really ahead of us. 
So I would say, could we then bring you guys up to the you know, to some committee to further study how we can combine the necessity that we have to go in the sustainability road, but see it as an, a possibility for new innovation and combine these two in, in any kind of a way. But in all honesty, I haven't discovered how to do that because the things that worked out pretty fine in China and in, in the US so far seems not to go in that direction. So that is in fact a challenge that I hope the European Commission can consider to open the floor and to come up with a number of proposals that, that hopefully supports this innovation and at the same time do not go backwards into less of sustainable um, regulatory frameworks. I think that's a great way to sum up actually that what the discussion that I've heard of sort of bring this to a close and thank you all for your, for your brilliant comments and insights there is that we heard that there were lots of different models that where innovation still thrives um, but yet there seemed to be an underlying message about um, a question if you like about the competitiveness of, of the European markets and what could solve that and, and what I heard I think was a very sort of a, a call for if you're going to do something be very thoughtful about why you're doing it and what effect it will have um, and but certainly a, a, a thing to explore um, I was also very struck by the comments about talent which I think is a is a particularly in, in digital and innovation I think that is a, a brilliant point as well as we're seeing it in ESG as well I think that is going to be the skills challenge for, for Europe is going to be immense in, in, in pursuing a, a competitiveness agenda um, and I, at the risk of sort of focusing on something that's very close to my heart, I think that Anne Helen made a very um, good case for understanding how um, reporting on performance is actually key to to kind of the, the way you interact with uh, across a, a, you know a series of factors, not just financial but uh, non-financial as well, is really key to making sure that you've got the finance that you need to be innovative and to um, and to thrive. So. Um, I thought that was a point well made. So I will leave it there with one minute over. Thank you very much for all of your comments, um, panelists, and um, I, I wish you a great afternoon and evening. I'll hand back to you, um, Irena. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And many thanks to all of you for sharing uh, quite some insights into such an important matter, hoping to see some challenges working out for the best. And I would like now to invite Goras Budvilšek, Chair of the Slovenian Directors Association, for his closing remarks. Goras, please take the floor. Thank you, Irina. Um, wow, this is a lot, a lot harder than I thought it would be. Um, we've heard so much and I've learned so much. Uh, it's quite hard to distill it into a few words and encompass, encompass everything. Uh, so I'll basically do the only thing I can do I'll subjectively touch on the things that impressed me the most, so I will undoubtedly forget to mention many, many important points that uh, our speakers raised, uh, for which I, I apologize in advance. As Madam Teigland um, opened up with nicely, uh, a lot is expected from corporate governance, not only in the coming years in this distant future, a lot is expected today, right now. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the very purpose of the company that seems to be changing. The problem is that what exactly the new purpose is and how it translates into duty of care and uh, uh, of the executives and board members is a part of a lively debate. What we do know is that it's built around the sustainable value creation achieved through safeguarding all stakeholders' interests. That's something that I think uh, all of the speakers agreed on. Um, but again, when we come to the details of uh, what exactly uh, specific solutions are, we still have uh, a lot of questions. Uh, Madam Dastamoinen pointed out the EU initiative in this area and the huge challenges and the potentials that uh, the EU has, I think, rightly detected. Um, the init this initiative aims to enable companies to better manage sustainability related matters in their own operations and in the value chains, which we've also heard a lot in the, in the, following, in the following discussions, and to focus on the long-term sustainable value creation. What 
uh, I was surprised to find out is that for this, we supposedly need not only new reporting rules, but also EU-wide due care standards and changes in the legal framework, including potential changes of liability of corporate board members. I agree with uh, Dr. Barker on one hand that this will indeed be an important gesture and seems to be kind of a, 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 a big step into changing the role of companies. But I also agree with Mr. Espelund and uh, some, other, some other speakers that we have to be very, very careful in approaching this topic. As I have discussed this many times with colleagues from all over European countries, any changes in this area need to be very, very well thought of. And we do run a risk of liability to everybody or even liability to nobody if we kind of jump the gun and, and, and implement changes that are not, that are not uh, coherent. Uh, so the changes in this Euro EU legislation, of course, will need to be compliant with existing EU laws and national laws and specifics. So we're all eagerly anticipating the first solutions due in December, uh, because at least I personally cannot predict what's, what specifically they might be. Um, in the opening session, as I said, we've touched upon the, the, the role of the companies and the moving away from the shareholder primacy into the stakeholder capitalism. But I do have to agree with Mr. Espelund again, where he pointed out that these good ideas um, are not really well defined yet. What exactly is stakeholder capitalism and what exactly is a sustainable company um, is still out there. We, can, we all know what the point is, but uh, we do not know exactly how to get there, except that it has a lot to do with the owners. And what came out of this debate and the following debate is that we have very specific wishes what our owners, our corporate owners should be like. And at the same time, we very acutely feel the need to attract more money and more owners. So we do seem to get into this dilemma of how we need to dereg deregulate and regulate at the same time. And a very, very legitimate question of how much can Europe do alone? and how much can we do and still stay competitive. Now, in panel one, I became very much optimistic because we heard a lot of practical solutions that are currently possible and done by, by European companies. Uh, it was really fascinating to me how much can be done if the companies are willing. Uh, the importance of strong risk management and internal control systems were very clearly illustrated. And uh, also the, the sustainability reporting and its role uh, within the companies today also, uh, I think, was, was clearly, clearly defined. I was also happy to hear that uh, remuneration schemes are beginning to align to sustainability criteria, which I think is a positive first step. Uh, it's the carrot uh, that we've talked so much about in this uh, carrot and stick, and stick debate. We've also heard about a burning need for a robust supply chain uh, due diligence. Uh, too many surprises and unknowns still happen and uh, the expectations of stakeholders are getting higher and higher. We've learned how it can pay off through, through better performance and better brand. Uh, and the only question remaining is how to present this added value, this long-term benefits and how to give them a proper place against the short term costs in the form of bigger expenses having to do with a more responsible and, uh, and more tightly regulated supply chain. In the panel two, we talked, we began with talking about the role of the boards. We've learned how different their roles are within Europe. And then we've learned how different they are actually in the United States between the private and, and the listed companies. So the question is, can we define an optimal role of the board in the strategic planning and strategic decision-making uh, capacity of the board, especially when you combine it with the uh, European, continental European, especially role of supervisory boards, which are very tightly uh, separated from decision-making into supervision of decisions they have 
actually nothing to do with so that they can more objectively supervise them. Um, we've learned that EU framework should be a level playing field and not put in risk the competitiveness and the innovation of the EU capital markets. Um, now I've, I've heard for the first time from Mr. Epstein how harsh this competition is even between the states in the United States. So, uh, and we've also learned how competitive some very short term opportunities or short termism focused opportunities are in the current environment of cheap money. The question that Mr. Epstein posed is very relevant. Uh, why are European tech companies not so-called unicorns? And can we turn responsibility into greater competitiveness for EU and not, and not a greater burden? Especially, uh, can we do it on our own? Uh, like Mrs. Monselato, as Ms. Madam Monselato rightly said, everybody should do it. But what if they don't? And what until they don't? Can we do it alone and be kind of this, uh, this pioneer in this area without risking our competitiveness? That I think is a question that still doesn't have a very, very simple, simple solution. So I think that there is really no debate about how important the coming years are and uh, the debate on what exactly the correct solutions are, what the next step should be is a lot more complex. Uh, I believe and uh, uh, that the EU institutions, national governments and businesses will take this opportunity to plan together for risk averse, uh, transformative, innovative and resilient growth scenarios. So uh, we may not have found this panacea for all of the world's problems in the sense of corporate governance or even answered how many of those corporate governance alone can solve, but we have believe we have managed to detect some important trends and decisions that await us. So in the name of the Slovenian Directors Association, I would like to thank our partners, ACCA, Business Europe and European issuers for joining the conference. And I would especially like to thank our co-organizers, ECODA and EY for putting this together. Thank you, thank you, Goras. Thank you for saying thank you uh, to all of our colleagues. And um, just um, one word uh, for saying goodbye. Stay well and stay safe. And best wishes to you all. Goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs> goodbye. Bye.